Okay, let's start the session now. Uh, hello guys, good morning and welcome you all in this DP900 session. Myself, Archie Desen, I'm your host for this session. Guys, if you have any question and queries, please put question on chat box. We'll be there to help you out. Let's moving ahead and talking about our event sponsor that is Synergetics. So Synergetics is in India, one of kind co-porting learning solution company. Now you will get a question like who we are and what we're doing. So answering your question, we bruise through our offering and also give comprehensive advisory service to clients who wish to modernize their framework. We educate, advise, implement and manage. Then the Synergetics solution offering that is Persona based onboarding solution, onboarding add on solution, certification solution, certification add on solution, reskilling solution, emerging technology training solution, certification hackathon solution, cloud adoption solution, latest technology training solution, sales pre sales training solution, practice playbook solution, and architecting solution. And what does Microsoft certification does? It will give you complete learning experience. You will get uh, uh, confidence to appear for the exam and get certified. Uh, this is skilling journey. Here you can advance yourself. First, you have to complete fundamental certification. Then you can go with the advanced role-based certification and expert level certification. In fundamental certification, we are providing you AJ 900, AI 900, DP 900, PL 900, and SC 900. In associate level certification, we are providing you many types of certification. Here you can see on my screen. In expert level certification, we are providing you AJ 305, SC 100, PL 600, and AJ 400. Also, we have special certification that is AZ120, AZ140, and AZ220. If you want any certification, you can connect with us. Certification offering. So certification will help you to increase your visibility, expand your knowledge and skills. We do provide certification add-on, onboarding add-on like short duration modules and more. Moving ahead and today training is organized and handled by the ATC community. So our ATC community is open to all the people who are interested in our cloud technology and various emerging technology. Under ATC community, we have emerging technology community for all. Then Azure Tech community for Tunekas. Emerging technology community for Suratkas. Azure Tech community for Nagpur. Guys, you just have to install the Meetup app and you can follow our communities there. Then and you have to follow the code of conduct, which will create a respectful environment for all the participants. Please note that participants are not allowed to take screenshot of the presentation and cannot do screen recording. We will try to upload this training on our official YouTube channel. So today's speaker for this training is Mish Shah. He is a Microsoft certified trainer and currently work with Synergetics as a trainer consultant. Agenda for this webinar, you will get to know more about the topic and benefit of it. In this session, we are providing you DP 900 complimentary learning achievement badge. You just have to follow the step and you will get the activated badge. Make sure guys, you follow us on our LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube for upcoming events and uh, other informations. Yeah. Thank you. Now, now I would like to hand over this mic over speaker. He will continue ahead. Yes, thank you, Arshi. So good morning to each and every one of you. Uh, and let's begin our webinar for today. Uh, before starting off with our webinar, I would just like to give a brief introduction about myself. My name is Mitsha, and I will be your mentor for today. I'm a Microsoft certified trainer. On top of that, I'm an Azure certified data engineer, Azure certified data scientist, and Azure certified AI engineer. And I've been in the data science field since the past six years, wherein I've delivered training for multiple international as well as domestic clients like Walmart, LTA, Mindtree, Deloitte, and many, many more. So yeah, that, that was just a brief introduction about me. Now let's dive into our webinar for So guys, today's webinar is about TP900 certification exam. In TP900 certification exam, basically the certification exam is dealing with uh, how you can work with data on the Azure platform. 
So now in order to work with data on the Azure platform, there are many services that Azure offers. OK, there are many, many services that Azure offers. So basically DP 900 certification exam focuses on those services. Now, when I say that uh, Azure offers you services to work on data, what exactly does it offer? So it offers you services to store data. It offers you services to analyze data. And it also offers you services to transform that data. OK, there will be some services who will just do one out of these three things. There will be some services who will be able to do all of these three things. OK, so DP Nanner certification exam. Is basically going to talk about uh, how you can use these services in order to work with data on Azure, whether it is to store data on Azure, whether it is to analyze data on Azure, or whether it is to transform data on Azure. So today what we'll do is since we just have four hours with us, we'll look into one such Azure service called Azure Synapse service. We'll look into one such Azure service called Azure Synapse service. And this Azure Synapse service will do all the three things related to the data. It will be able, uh, we can use it to store data. We can use it to analyze data. We can also use it to transform data. So let's go ahead and like dive into Azure Synapse service. So the first lab that we'll perform today is to explore that Azure Synapse service. OK, and there are many, many things that we'll do with it. Uh, let's start with our first lab. In the first lab, what we'll be doing is we'll be using the Azure Synapse service to copy data. To copy data. From one place to another. OK, so we'll have some data with us and we'll copy it back from one place to another using the Azure Synapse service. Later, we'll also see how using the Azure Synapse service, we can analyze data, how using the Azure Synapse service, we can transform data. All of that we'll see today. OK, so today our entire lecture is going to be focused on Azure Synapse service. So let's start. So what I'm going to do is I have a link with me uh, that contains the data. So that data is uploaded on GitHub. What I want to do is that data from GitHub. I want to store it in some place. OK, so that data from GitHub. I want to send it to some place. Let's suppose I want to send it to uh, some service in Azure like a storage account. What is a storage account? I will talk to you about it in detail, but in simple words, just think of it as an alternative of Google Drive. Just like Google Drive is a product by Google, wherein you can store all of uh, any type of files. Similarly, storage account is a product by Azure, wherein you can store any type of files. There is a lot other things to it as well, but in simple words, just understand it like this: that a storage account is like an alternative of Google Drive. Fine. I'll talk about it in detail, right? so don't worry. So what I'm going to do is I want to send my data from GitHub to storage account. OK, so I want to send my data or I want to copy my data from GitHub to storage account. How will I be doing it? I'll be doing this with help of Azure Synapse service. OK, there are a lot of other things that we'll see with help of Azure Synapse service, but this is the first lab demonstration that we are seeing right now to copy data from GitHub to a storage account. Fine. So let's create a storage account first. OK, uh, let's have a storage account ready. Once it's ready, then we'll see how we can transfer data from GitHub to storage account. OK, so let's set up a storage account. So in order to use the storage account service, we have to create a resource of that service. In Azure, it's a rule that whenever you are going to use any service of Azure, you have to create a resource of that service. So similarly over here in order to use the storage account service of Azure, we'll have to create a resource of it. So let's create a resource in order to do that in the search bar. I will try to search for storage account. And here you can see in my search result, I can see an option for storage account service. I'll click on it. And then in order to use this service, I will have to create a resource of this service. So let's try to create the resource. So I'll click on the create button over here to create a resource of the storage account service. When I do that, I'm redirected to a form that I have to fill. So let's go ahead and let's fill in the details of this form over here. OK, uh, so what I will do is uh, I'll just uh, fill in all the fields in the form over here. 
first field in the form is asking me to select subscription. Remember that in your Azure account, remember guys that in your Azure account, Okay, sorry guys, I think I got disconnected in between. Uh, I hope uh, you are able to hear me now. Are you able to hear me properly, guys? Are you able to hear me? Yes, really, okay. Fine, so let's move forward. So as I was saying is what we are going to do today, we are going to explore Azure Synapse service. And the first lab that we are performing right now is to copy data from one place to another. There are a lot of other labs that we'll see as well. But this is the first lab of today to copy data, let's say from GitHub to storage account service. So in order to first use the storage account service, I will have to create a resource of it. And this is what I'm doing currently. I'm creating a resource of storage account service. But in order to do that, I will have to fill this form over here. Once I fill in the form, then I'll be able to create a resource of storage account service. The first field in the form is asking me to select subscription. So let's do that. Now remember that in your Azure account, you can have more than one subscriptions with you. Okay, so for example, my Azure account is smitsha397 at gmail.com. Here in this Azure account, I can have more than one subscriptions. Okay, in each subscription, I can have different amount of money left in it. Okay, so for example, in the first subscription, let's say I have $800. In the second subscription, let's say I have $10. In the third subscription, I have $30 and so on. Remember that whenever you are going to use any service of Azure, it is going to charge you some money. So make sure that you select a subscription that has enough amount of money left in it. Okay. So make sure that you select a subscription that has enough amount of money left in it. There are other rules of as well, uh, apart from uh, money, uh, which is that let's say you have a company. Okay, let's say you are the CEO of a company. Now you want to give Azure account to every employee of your company. So what will you do? Uh, you will create subscriptions for everyone. So let's say for the first employee, you will create one subscription, uh, which will have different uh, permissions associated with it. Okay, let's say you uh, uh, employee of your sales team. Uh, for that employee also, you will have a different subscription. It will have different permissions in it. Okay, uh, for that guy in the sales team, you will make sure that some services are not visible to him. Okay, fine. So, uh, subscriptions play that role as well. Uh, it helps to uh, set permissions. Okay, uh, but fine. Uh, remember over here that you have to select the subscription of your choice. That has enough money in it, has enough enough fun permissions for you to use. Okay. Fine. Let's go. Ahead. Here in my scenario, though, I did have many subscriptions with me earlier. However, I have uh, deactivated those other subscriptions. So currently, I have only one active subscription left with me, which is this MSDN subscription. So I have no other option but to select that. Okay. Select that uh, subscription here. Then. After that, it is asking me to select a resource group for my resource. Okay. So in Azure, it's a rule that whenever you are creating a resource within Azure, that resource has to fall within some of the other resources. Okay, there are many benefits of having a resource group. Let me mention those benefits over here. So let's suppose you are working on a project in your office. And for that project, you have created multiple resources. Let's say the first resource you created, uh, let's say it's a SQL resource. The second resource that you created, let's say it's some AI resource. Okay, and so on. Let's say like that you created 20 such resources. Okay, and now let's say after six months that project is over and now uh, you do not have need for any of the resources in your project. So what can you do? You can go ahead and delete the resources one by one, right? But that will be very tedious. Okay, you will have to go inside every resource, then click on the delete button to delete it. Right? Like that, you will have to do it for all the 20 resources that you have to. It might be a little te tedious. Instead of that, why don't we have this project? Okay, uh, why don't we have this project over here? And we have created resources of that project. So why don't we have the resources of the same project inside the same resource group? 
So if we are creating resource uh, resources belonging to same project, why don't we have it inside of the same resource? And when the time for deletion comes, what can happen is I can directly delete the resource group altogether. With that, all the resources in the resource group will automatically get deleted. Okay, so resource group helps for life cycle management. That if the resources have the same life cycle, they should be in the same resource. So it helps for better life cycle management. There are other benefits as well. Let's suppose you created a project and for that project, you created multiple resources. Okay, let's say one resource is the storage account resource, another resource is the SQL resource, and like that, you created many resources. Let's say you created 20 resources. Now, you want to calculate the total cost incurred by your project. So, what can you do? You can go into every resource individually and see the cost of every individual resource. So, you will go to the first resource and observe that in the first resource, uh, uh, $30 were charged. For the first resource, $30 were charged. For the second resource, $12.2 were charged, and so on. Okay. Like that, you will see the cost. Right. So why don't we do one thing? Why don't we have resources belonging to same project inside the same resource group? Why don't we have resources belonging to same project inside the same resource group? And when the time for cost calculation comes, you can directly go to the resource group and with a single click of the button, you will get to know the cost of all the resources in that resource group. Okay. So resource group also helps for cost management. Okay, there are other benefits as well, but over here I have listed down some benefits so that you can get an idea that resource group basically helps you for better management of resources. And in Azure, it's so good that whenever you create any resource, not just the resource of storage account service, but any resource you create, that resource has to fall within some of the other resources. So here you can select an existing resource group or create a new one. Let me go ahead and let me create a new resource group. So I'll create a new resource group. I'll call it webinar RC. Okay. With this, that resource group will be created. Next, it is asking me to give a name to the storage account resource. So let's give it a name. Uh, I will give it a name, say webinar storage resource. Okay. Remember that the name that you give has to be unique across Azure. So if I give it a name like ABC, uh, most probably it will give me an error and you can see it does give me an error saying that this name has already been taken by someone else. Okay, so make sure that the name that you give has to be unique across it. Fine. This name that I have given uh, was the unique name, so it has been accepted by the Azure platform. Okay, after that it is asking me to select a region in which my resource will lie. So you want this resource to be deployed in which uh, region or, or uh, basically, you know, uh, Azure has servers in different, different region. It has some servers in India, it has some servers in US and at many other places. So you want the resource to be deployed in a serv server of which region? Okay, so you need to select that region. Make sure that you select a region closer to your user. Let's say your user is in India, then make sure that you choose a region closer to India just for better latency. Okay just for better latency. So if your user is in India, then make sure to choose a region closer to India just for better latency. Right. So you can select any region of your choice over here. I'll keep it default. I'll keep it best use only. That's fine for me. After that, it is asking you to select performance level. So there are two options shown over here. First is standard, second is premium. So what is the difference between the uh, well, let's say I'm creating a storage account resource. What is a storage account resource? Can anybody in the chat tell me what is a storage account resource? Uh, Abbasi, Umesh, Kishwan, Satyaji, can any one of you tell me what is a storage account resource? What I mean, what does it help me to do? In a storage account resource, what we can do? Anybody with the answer? I gave you a brief explanation earlier. What does the storage account resource do? Pradeep has given the correct answer. It allows us to store any type of files, right? It allows us to store any type of files. 
So it's an alternative of Google Drive. Just like Google Drive is a product by Google in which you can store any type of files. Storage account is a product by Azure where you can store any type of files. Okay, right. Now let's say you have stored some files in, in your storage account. Now you want to uh, read the data or let's say you want to retrieve those files. Okay, let's say you store some files in storage account and now you want to retrieve those files back. Now, uh, in order to retrieve the files, in order to open the files, there will be some speed involved, right? Maybe uh, uh, let's say if the place at which we have stored the files is not good, then in order to retrieve data from that place, it will be slightly time more time consuming. Okay. However, let's say if the place in which we store the data is a good place, then uh, uh, we will not have to spend more time in order to retrieve data from that place. Fine. So basically, let's say you want to retrieve data from your storage account. Then how fast do you want to retrieve? If you select premium tier, then what will happen is the time consumed will be very, very less. On the other hand, with standard tier, the time consumed will be slightly higher. But the benefit of standard tier is that cost will be less. But, and uh, with premium tier, cost will be low. So with premium tier, sorry, uh, with standard tier, cost is less. With premium tier, cost is high. Okay. With standard tier, cost is less. With premium tier, cost is high. So remember that. But benefit of premium tier is what? That with premium tier, you can uh, fetch data from your storage account at a much faster pace as compared to standard. Okay. So benefit of premium tier is that that tier is more fast. If you select that tier, then you will be able to retrieve data from your storage account in, at a much faster pace. That is the benefit of premium tier. But the disadvantage is what? Disadvantage of premium tier is that it is very it is slightly costly. Okay. On the other hand, standard tier is not that costly. Okay, so that's a benefit of standard tier that it's not that costly. However, the disadvantage is that it will the latency will be slightly higher. That means the time taken to retrieve data from the storage account will be slightly more. But that's fine for me uh, to reduce cost. I will select standard tier over here. After that, it is asking me to select redundancy. Now. What is redundancy? So what Azure is allowing you to do over here is that it is allowing you to create a copy of the storage account resource. Okay, it is allowing you to create a copy of the storage account resource. So let's say you have created a storage account resource and you have deployed it on some server of Azure. Now let's say that server got destroyed because of some other reason or that server got corrupted or that server got hacked because of which you are not able to use the storage account resource that you created. So that will be a big problem, right? Let's say you're working in a company and you have uploaded your company's files into a storage account resource. Now that storage account resource was on some server of Azure and now that server has been hacked or it has been corrupted. Some issue has occurred with that server. And because of that, you are not able to use the resource deployed in that server. This is a big problem. So uh, what Azure allows you to do, it allows you to create a copy of that resource and deploy it in some other server. Okay, so if at all, let's say my primary resource that I created, I'm, I am not able to access it because what of whatever reason, then what I can do is uh, Azure uh, will do one thing. It will uh, uh, basically whatever work you are doing on the primary storage account resource, that same work, it will also do it on the copy resource. So let's say you have uploaded some files in the primary storage account resource. In the background, what it Azure will do is the same work it will do it in the copy resource as well. So let's say going forward, you are not able to use your primary resource for whatever reason. Okay, you have deployed your primary resource on some server. Okay, on some server, let's say in US. Okay, and now let's say that server in US is now not available. Because of that, your primary resource you will not be able to use. So what Azure will do is Azure has uh, uh, Azure will make uh, will make sure that you are given uh, access to the copy resource then. Okay, so remember that whatever work you do in the primary resource, same work Azure will do it in the copy resource as well. So let's say you have uploaded five files in your primary resource. Azure will upload those five files in the copy resource as well. Okay, so let's say uh, you have created that copy resource somewhere in India. Okay, and now your primary resource is not available. Well, you can use the copy resource which is available in India and you won't even know 
whether you are using the primary resource or the copy resource. Azure will take care of it in the back. Okay. So Azure will take care of it that if the primary resource is not available, uh, then um, at least uh, in the meantime, you can use the copy of that primary resource okay. so that you can do your task and your task does not get affected. Fine. So here there are various options to create copy. Let's go ahead and let's explore each option one by one. Okay. So here uh, the first option is uh, locally redundant storage. What does locally redundant storage mean? Uh, locally redundant storage guys means that let's say I'm creating a copy uh, of my resource. Uh, let's say my uh, primary resource is deployed in India. Okay, let's say somewhere in West India. Okay, in Western part of India. Okay, uh, then if my primary resource is deployed in Western part of India, then my copy of the resource will also be deployed in the same exact location. It will also be deployed in Western part of India. Okay, uh, so this is what happens in locally redundant storage. Whereas in geo redundant storage, what happens is let's say you have created a primary resource somewhere in western part of India. Then the copy of that resource will be created in some other uh, geo location. Uh, let's say somewhere like uh, South US. Okay. So for example, let's say if all the servers in West India get corrupted, something happens. Let's say there are floods, something like that. At least you can use the copy of the resource, which is deployed at a completely different geo location. So that is what happens in geo redundant storage. So geo redundant storage is the best option that you can select for redundancy. However, it's the most costlier option as well. Okay, it's the most costlier option. So the least costly option is locally redundant storage. Okay, so I will go ahead and I will select that one. Uh, there are other uh, redundancy options as well. Uh, so for example, you have this zone redundant storage. Now, what does this zone redundant storage mean? Let's go ahead and let's see. What does locally redundant storage mean, guys? Can anyone tell me what does locally redundant storage means? Before I move on to zone redundant storage, what does locally redundant storage mean? Anyone with the answer? For locally redundant storage. With locally redundant storage, what happens? Remember, locally redundant storage is the most basic and cost effective redundancy option. Okay. And what it does is it replicates, it replicates your data uh, three times. Okay. It replicates your data three times. Uh, that means it creates three copies within a physical location in the selected Azure region. So within the same region only. So for example, let's say I've selected a region of West US 2. Within the same region, it will replicate the data three times. So that means it will create three copies. So locally redundant storage is a good choice for protecting your data from normal hardware failures, but not for ensuring high availability in case of a major incident like a natural disaster. Let's say because of natural disaster, all the servers of West US 2 were destroyed. Then what will happen? The primary resource you will not be able to access. With that, the copy of the primary resource also you will not be able to access. Why? Right? Because the copy you had uh, deployed in the same region. Okay. So that's what happens in locally redundant storage. In geo redundant storage, you know, this option provides a higher uh, level of durability by replicating your data to a secondary region. That is hundreds of miles away from your primary region. So remember, geo redundant storage creates six copies of your data. Well, as locally redundant storage creates three copies, geo redundant storage creates six copies of your data with three in the primary region and three in the secondary region. Remember, it's designed to provide protection against regional outages. So data is replicated asynchronously to the secondary region, making it suitable for backup scenarios. Then you have zone redundant storage. So what does zone redundant storage mean? So zone redundant storage replicates your data across three availability zones in the primary region. Okay, what are availability zones? Availability zones are unique physical locations within an Azure region. So let's say uh, we have, let's suppose Mumbai region. Okay, within Mumbai region, you will have zones. I, uh, if any one of you are stay, staying in Mumbai, you will know that in Mumbai there are different, different zones. Uh, we have, let's say, uh, South Mumbai zone. 
Okay, wherein you have places like Church Gate and all of that, right? Uh, we have other zones as well. Okay, so let's say so let's suppose we have these zones. Okay. Uh, let's suppose we have these zones, South Mumbai, then we have a place called Gori uh, Then uh, we have uh, some other place. Let's say we have a place called Andheri in uh, Mumbai. Okay. Uh, if anyone feels staying in Mumbai, you will know these places. So let's say we have these different zones in Mumbai, South Mumbai zone, Gori Vali zone, Andheri zone. Okay. Now what happens in zone redundant storage is zone redundant storage replicates your data across three availability zones in the primary region. Okay, so within this Mumbai region, it will replicate your data across three different zones. Okay, across three different zones. Remember availability zones are unique physical locations within a region. And each zone is made up of one or more data centers equipped with independent power, independent cooling and independent networking. Okay, so zone redundant storage is recommended for scenarios that require high availability and protection against data center level failures. Then after that, you have this last option called GZRS, also known as Geo Zone Redundant Storage. So GZRS combines the high availability of ZRS, okay, with the regional disaster recovery of GRS. So it combines these two. Okay, so it replicates your data across availability zones in the primary region and also uh, 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 across the secondary region as well. Okay, so here you are combining uh, both uh, the concepts of GRS and ZRS. In GRS, what was happening? In GRS, what was happening was let's say uh, you are creating uh, your primary resource somewhere in West US, then the second resource will be created, uh, will be stored somewhere uh, far away from West US, that's somewhere in India. Okay, that was the concept okay, of uh, geo redundant storage. In uh, zone redundant storage, what was the concept? That within that region, uh, you will have your uh, uh, resource replicated in three different availability modes. So let's say in West US, let's say we have a zone for Florida. Let's say we have a zone for uh, California. Let's say we have a zone for uh, Chicago. Okay, so in these three different places, it will be deployed. Similarly, in India, in three different availability zones, it will be deployed. This is what happens in GZRS. Okay, so GZRS combines these two concepts. It combines the GRS concept and the ZRS concept. Fine. So you can select the redundancy option of your choice. I will choose the first option here. Let me click on the next button. Okay. And with that, you are being asked for different, different advanced security options. Remember that based on these options that you see over here, you do get questions asked in the exam. Okay. So you might get questions asked like, what is the difference? Uh, so one second, let me go back. So you might get a, a questions asked like, what is the difference between ZRS and GRS? Based on that, you can get a question asked in the examination. Okay, so whatever we are learning over here, based on that, you might get asked questions in the examination. Okay, so remember that. Anyways, let me click on the next button. And now I'm being asked to mention various security related settings. So let me go ahead and let me mention, uh, let me fill up all these security details. Okay, uh, now there are many options shown over here. First option is called required secure transfer for REST API operations. What does this option mean? So this option, when I enable it, it requires that all requests to the storage account are made over HTTPS. Remember, if I select this option, it requires that all the requests to the storage account are made over HTTPS, which ensures that any data sent to or from the storage account is encrypted in transit. Okay, is encrypted in transit. So if you want to enable it, you can enable it up to you. If you want to disable it, it's up. Enter the options. Okay. So this is what that first option. Is. Now let's go ahead and uh, let's look at the second option over here. Now, uh, what is the second option? So what are containers? So in a storage account, uh, you can create folders or containers. 
Okay, you can think of containers as basically folders. Okay, so just like in your laptop, you can create folders and within those folders, you can upload files. Similarly, in a storage account, you can create folders. The official word for folders is contains. Okay, so let's say you create folders in your storage account, but for individual folders, you want to give different, uh, you want to set different permissions that the first folder in your storage account can only be accessed by your sales team. The second folder in your storage account can only be accessed by your ITD and so on. Okay, uh, so if you want to do that, then you can go ahead and uh, enable this option as well. It's up to you. Fine. The third option is enables storage account key access. So this option allows access to the storage account using account keys. Remember, these keys are essentially passwords that grant full access to the account. So it's important to keep them secure. Okay, and I will show you how those keys look like. So don't worry about it. After that, we have this option called default to Microsoft Enter authorization in the Azure portal. So guys, this is an option to use Microsoft Entra for managing permissions within the Azure portal. If I leave it unchecked, then what will happen? The Azure portal will use its standard authorization method. So if you want Azure to use a standard authorization method, you uh, leave it unchecked, it's up to you. Okay. Uh, remember, uh, if I enable it, then what will happen? Storage account would default to using Azure Active Directory. Okay, for authorization in the Azure portal. And this is a more secure authorization method compared to using this. Why it's a more secure one? Let's go ahead and let's uh, understand uh, that. Why it's a more secure one? Okay, so let's go ahead and let's understand that. As compared to keys, why is Azure Active Directory a more secure one? And there is a, a way of doing authorization even better than Azure Active Directory. I will talk to you about that as well. But just to recap this, with this, what will happen if I select this option? Then what will happen? So instead of using keys to do authentication, it will use Azure Active Directory. It will use Azure Active Directory. Okay. And how is it better? Let's go ahead and let's understand it. OK, so for example, guys, let's suppose you have uh, used, uh, you have hired a virtual machine from Azure. OK, let's say you have hired a virtual machine on, on Azure uh, that has certain RAM, certain uh, uh, memory. OK, so let's say you have hired a virtual machine from Azure. And what you want to do is uh, currently you want to use some data that is uploaded in Azure SQL database. So for that, you have written some code. So what you will do, first of all, this code, you will place it into your uh, Azure virtual machine, right? You will place it into your Azure virtual machine. But in order for me to access the Azure SQL database, can I say, uh, Bhaskar, that I will have to provide some authentication in, adult, in, in order for me to gain access to Azure SQL database? Can I say that I will have to provide some author uh, authorization? Yes or no, Bhaskar? Apasi, Raghu, what do you think? In order for me to access Azure SQL database, will I have to provide authentication or not? Or will anyone be able to access? No, right? We'll have to provide some authentication. Oh, so let's say we have a key. Okay, let's say we have a key. And using that key, we are able to uh, do authentication. So let's say what I will do is I will have a key. And that key, I will place it in my code. Okay, that key I will place it in my code. And uh, with that, what will happen is, um, with that key that I have placed in my code, I'll be able to use the Azure SQL database. Okay, and uh, once I gain access to Azure SQL database, I can use the data with it. Fine. Now, can you tell me a problem with this approach? What could be a problem with this approach? Exposing your key in your coding file. What could be a problem? Exposing your key in your coding file. What could be a problem with it? What could be a problem? Can I say if my key is exposed in my coding file, then if anybody sees the 
uh, let's say if anybody has access to my coding file, they will be uh, able to see that key as well. If they are able to see that key, then using it, they will be able to use the Azure SQL database. So can I say, Abbasi, that this is not a more that that this is not the most secure approach that you are exposing your key in your coding file? Because let's say if anybody is able to see your coding file, then they will be able to see the key inside your coding file. Yes or no? E is nothing but a, a collection of alphanumeric characters. And I will show you how that key looks like. Okay, so this is not a secure approach. Agreed or not, Abbasi? Faster, everybody else. That exposing your key in your coding file is not the ideal approach, right? So key should be protected. Okay, fine. So what we can do is we can use help of another service in Azure called Azure Key Vault. And what we'll do is we will tell Azure Key Vault to store the key. We will tell Azure Key Vault to store the key. Okay. But can you tell me a problem with this approach as well? That we will have Azure Key Vault to store the key. But can you tell me a problem with this approach? Abbasi says we'll have Key Vault to store it. Correct. This is a better approach than the first one. But there is a problem with this approach as well. Ah, Pradeep has given the correct answer. Pradeep says now our key is stored in Key Vault. So Pradeep, can I say I will need to have authentication to Azure Key Vault? So again, I will have to mention some tokens, some key, something I will have to mention, right? As Pradeep mentions that, okay, our key is now stored in Key Vault. Instead of storing our key in our coding file, now we are storing our key in Key Vault. But in order for my code to use the key instead of Key Vault, I will have to gain authorization to this Key Vault. Only then I'll be able to access. So in order to gain authorization, I will mention some configuration details in my code. Okay, I will mention some configuration details in my code. Okay, so I'll mention this configuration details. Now, Pradeep, can I say that if anybody sees my coding file, they'll be also be able to see my configuration. And if they see my configuration, using that configuration, they will gain authorization to Azure Key Vault. So can I say again, authorization issue still exists. Agreed, Pradeep? So this approach is better than previous one, but again, there is a problem. The problem is that let's say uh, uh, that, okay, you are uh, instead of storing your key in your coding file, you're storing your key in a separate place of key vault. But in order for your code to use the key in your key vault, it will need to gain authorization from key vault. And in order to gain that authorization, it will mention some configuration in the coding file. So if anybody is able to see the coding file, they will be able to see the configuration as well. And with that configuration, they can get authorization to Azure Key Vault. So again, not the most secure option. Okay. So let's say companies wanted a solution in which there are no secrets, uh, no key mentioned in the coding file, no configuration mentioned in the coding file. Then what to do? Okay. That is when the concept of managed identities came into place. Okay. That is when the concept of Managed identities came into place. And let's go ahead and let's understand the concept of managed identities. There are two types of managed identities. First is system assigned managed identity. Second is user assigned managed identity. So let's go ahead and let's talk about it. Okay. So what is system assigned managed identity? What is user assigned managed identity? Oh, let's understand. Now, uh, let's take a scenario. For that scenario, I will need help of one student. So let me take help of one student over here. I'll uh, need to unmute someone's mic. So Pradeep, I will need your help, buddy. I will unmute your mic and I will need your help. Uh, let me unmute your mic and I will need your help for a few minutes. Ah. So Pradeep, uh, are you Hi. able to unmute? Hi, everyone. Yes. Hello. If for some reason, I'm not able to hear Pradeep. Uh, is it clear? Uh, okay. Pradeep, can you? Uh, Achha, Paskar can hear you. Then why am I not? Why am I not able to? Okay, one second, guys. Let me check if there is anything wrong. Okay, Pradeep, 
uh, can you speak something again? Yes. Uh, my uh -huh. voice is audible. Yes. Yes. Now it's perfectly audible. Okay. Perfect. So, uh, Pradeep, uh, we looked at two scenarios of uh, uh, doing authentication. In the first scenario, what we were doing, we were storing the key directly inside of our coding file. That was not secure, right? So instead of yes. that, what did we do, Pradeep? Instead of that, we have a, a vault, and so to so we can store all the keys there. Perfect. So instead of storing our key in our coding file, we store our keys inside of a uh, another Azure service called Azure Key Vault. Okay, so Azure Key Vault will store the keys. But in order for me to use the key inside of Azure Key Vault, I will have to gain authentication to Azure Key Vault. So again, a problem existed that in order to gain that authentication, what we'll have to do is we'll have to mention some configuration details, some token we'll have to mention, and uh, that token will mention in our coding file. So again, a problem existed that if anybody is able to see our coding file, they'll be able to see this configuration and through that configuration, they will be able to access the Azure Key Vault. So again, not fully secure. So that's when a new concept was introduced called Azure Managed Identities. There are two types of managed identities. One is system assigned managed identity. Another is user assigned managed identity. Now, let's go ahead and let's understand it. Now, uh, let's say, uh, Pradeep, you are an employee of an office. And every time when you go to that office, you have to provide some authentication uh, uh, to gain access to the office. Yes or no? Yes. It could be in the form of ID card or fingerprint or whatever, some authentication. Okay, so let's say we have an ID card. Uh, now, let's suppose, uh, uh, Pradeep, that you always have to carry that ID card to your office. Sometimes what, what might happen is you might forget to carry that ID card with you. Uh, because of that, how will you gain access? It will be a big problem. Okay. So, Pradeep, wouldn't it be better if we hire a third person who will, let's say, uh, you are the, uh, let's say this is Pradeep and this is your office. Okay, and you have an ID card, but let's say it is too difficult for you to carry the ID card every time. So instead of that, we'll have a third person, a third party. Okay, and what that person will do is that person is specifically hired for keeping your ID card. So now, Pradeep, when you go to your office, you can just tell this third person, he will be always outside the office gate. He will be always outside the office gate. And you will tell this third person that, okay, boss, please show the ID card to uh, the security team. And that third person will show the ID card. And based on that, you will get the access. Can I say with this approach, Pradeep, what is happening is you yourself don't have to store any, uh, uh, you can say, secret with you. Like, for example, ID card, let's say, is a secret. Okay. With, with help of that ID card, you gain access. So can I say now you are completely free, Pradeep? Yes, uh, even uh -huh. with this approach, we need to uh -huh. validate uh, that that party person should validate us whether Correct. I'm the right person uh, and having a, a permission to enter. So you should uh -huh. validate my employee ID or something in order to uh -huh. further give a permission. Perfect. Correct. But it will be a one time process. In that one time process, what you will do is you will tell your uh, security team. OK, you will tell your security team or let me put it. Let me give this heading over here that this is the security team. OK, so this is a one time process that you will tell the security team that, OK, you are hiring this third party person who will store the ID card. So don't ask the ID card from me. Ask it from this person. OK, so that person will give the ID card uh, and uh, 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 that person will check who is coming. Let's say he checks that, OK, Pradeep is coming. So it will show the ID card of Pradeep to the security team. OK, but uh, this is a one time process. In this one time process, what we are doing is we are asking the security team to trust this third party person. OK, to trust this third party person and that third party person will say that, OK, Pradeep is a employee of your office. Give access to this employee. So can I say over here, if let's say we have such third party person who the company trusts a lot. OK, let's say if, uh, if they if we hire such third party person who the company trusts a lot. And if that third party person says that, OK, uh, Pradeep is coming, I can see him coming to the office. So security team, please give access to him. So can I say 
with this what will happen is you yourself won't have to carry the id card every time na yes so now you are free you are free okay so let's say pradeep for you he uh, stores your id card okay now let's say we have another employee let's say we have another employee abbasi okay we have another employee abbasi then can i say for abbasi as well he will have to store his id card agreed or not yes correct pradeep yes for each okay. user yes ha ah, correct correct so let's say let's say i have four coding files then can i say i will have to store four id cards yes yes so let's say i have uh, or uh, in uh, technical terms let's say i have four those four virtual machines have four coding files then for each coding file i will have, i will have to create one id card and when the time for access comes what i will do is i will have this third person tell the security team that okay i have this id card over here uh, uh, that okay uh, this virtual machine uh, wants to access the azure sql database so this third party will say that okay i have the id card of this virtual machine please give access to it so now can i say the inside the virtual machine you will have your coding file and in your coding file you are not storing any secrets whatsoever so now your coding file is secret free now your coding file is secret free okay and uh, in order to do this what we are doing is we are hiring this third party called azure active directory that is what azure active directory does instead of you storing your id card okay azure active directory stores that id card for you but pradeep let's say like that uh, we have uh, 100 such virtual machines then with 100 virtual machines my azure active directory will have to store how many id cards 100 100 okay instead of that why don't we do one thing why don't we do one thing uh, let's say uh, pradeep that you abbasi and me are uh, in the same team okay so instead of storing instead of having different id cards for us why don't we have one id card for us combined okay why don't we have one id card for us combined so that is what user assigned managed identity does in system assigned managed identity you get different id card for different source let's say one source is this virtual machine then you will have a different id card for that second source is another virtual machine you will have a different id card for that and so on okay this is what happens in system assigned managed identity in user assigned managed identity what you do is you yourself set create a custom id card so pradeep let's say what i am saying is instead of having different id card for different members of the same team why don't we have one id card so let's say pradeep you me and abbasi are of the same team we have the same level let's say you me and abbasi are of the same designation okay so we have same access same everything okay so instead of having different id cards why don't we have one id card for us as a team and that id card we can then share as a team okay uh, so in that scenario pradeep can i say i will have to create a custom id card yes yes and that is what user assigned managed identity does it creates so a custom I, id card uh, so just one question so huh. if all the three users are going to use the same sql uh, then only it is applicable right correct correct then only it's applicable correct ha huh. so if these if let's say multiple sources are accessing the same destination so let's say for example pradeep you me and abbasi were uh, had had uh, we were in the same office same department everything was same then only it was applicable na let's say pradeep on the other hand you have a person of hr team or let's say some other person in different office will you guys of two separate office share the same id card no yes but let's say your destination was same let's say you me and abbasi wanted to go to same destination then only that concept applied of sharing the same id card so similarly pradeep you are absolutely right this concept of sharing same id card applies only if our destination is the same here because four virtual machines wanted to access the same thing the destination was the same that's why that concept of sharing the id card happens okay so in system assigned managed identity you get a id card for every source individually whereas in user assigned managed identity what you do is if let's say you have multiple sources that are uh, that are going to access the same destination 
then you will have one ID card, and that one ID card will be sh uh, shared across these multiple sources. Okay. All right. So, uh, Pradeep, just to ask you a question, isn't this a concept of managed identity better in, in, in a sense that now with this concept of managed identity, in your virtual machine and in your virtual machine, you will have some code written, uh, some coding file mentioned. And in that coding file now, in that coding file now, there is no secret stored whatsoever. Agreed or not? Yes. Right. And that is uh, the magic of the concept of managed identities. Okay. In order to use this concept called managed identities, we have to hire this third party service. And what is the name of it, Pradeep? Active Directory. Correct. Azure Active Directory. And guys, if I select this option on the Azure portal, if I select this option, it will do the same thing. It will activate that concept of managed identities. However, I don't want to do that. I want to stick with the concept of keys. I want to have my key uh, and that if at all I want to access, let's say my Azure SQL database or any other resource, then what I will do is uh, I will just mention that key of it in my coding file. So I'm fine with it. Although it's not the most secure option, but for now I'm fine with it. Okay, fine. Pradeep, up till now, everything is making sense. Yes. Yes. Okay. Fine. Uh, thanks for help. Uh, just right. one question. Huh. Sorry. Uh, before. Uh, huh. So, in case if if you're giving three person access to the same database, you consider like that. Uh, huh. Will that? So, if they are accessing at the same time, th there should be locking system, locking mechanism, right? Uh, see, uh, the purpose. Uh, ha ha ha. Ha. You are right. That locking system will take place. And I'll talk about that locking system that yes, if multiple sources are accessing the same destination. So let's say if this were one virtual machine is doing some changes over here. Okay, then uh, what might happen is uh, you are absolutely right. We'll have to take care of that locking system. And that is what uh, uh, it depends on the destination body, whether that destination has that locking system or not. In this scenario, Azure SQL database will have that locking system. Okay, so that multiple sources yes. are not doing the changes at the same time. So it entirely depends on the destination. It does not depend on source. It does not depend on this active directory. It entirely depends on this destination. If that destination has the locking system, then well and good. If it does not have, then it will be a problem. You are absolutely right. Okay, thank you. Yes, well, so it entirely depends on the destination. But yeah, uh, Azure SQL database does have that locking system in place. So we don't have to worry about how is that locking system? Uh, all of that we'll see it. Okay. Anyways. So it entirely depends on that destination, remember. Okay. After that, the next field in the form is asking me to select minimum TLS version. So remember, this drop down is allowing me to select the minimum version of transport layer security that clients are required to use when connecting to the storage account. TLS, remember, is a protocol that ensures privacy between communicating applications and their users on the internet. Uh, here, we have set the TLS version to 1.2. Uh, remember to choose the most recent version. So here, the recent version is 1.2 version, so I'm selecting that. After that, the next option is asking me to choose permitted scope for copy operations. Okay, so this setting allows you to limit the scope from which copy operations to the storage account can be performed. So uh, let's say if you select this option called from any storage account, then what can happen is uh, you can copy data. Uh, okay, so what can happen is let's say you're creating this storage account resource currently over here. This is your current storage account resource. This is your current storage account resource. Okay, uh, so what you want to see is uh, who all can copy data into the storage account resource. So for that, you need to select the option, appropriate option. Now, there are many options shown to you over here. Let's go ahead and let's understand uh, the options one by one. Okay, so what we'll do is these options will understand one by one. So what does this option called from any storage account mean? It means that the storage account can be used to copy data from any other storage account that you have access to. Okay, it means that this, what does it mean? That the storage account can be used to copy data from any other storage account that we have access to. The other options we'll see ahead uh, when the appropriate time comes. 
I will explain the other options to you as well. But remember, what does this option mean? It means that the storage account can be used to copy data from any other storage account that you have accessed. Okay. After that, you have this option called enable hierarchical namespace. With this, what will happen? And if I don't enable this, then what will happen? If I don't enable, if you don't enable this, then what will happen is your storage account will be called Gen 1 storage account. And in Gen 1 storage account, what happens is uh, you will be able to create multiple folders or multiple containers. But within those multiple folders or multiple containers, you will not be able to create subfolders. Okay, you will not be able to create subfolders. So all you will be doing is you will be creating folders. Within those folders, you will be uploading your files. Okay. Whereas if you enable this option, then what will happen is your storage account will be called Gen2 storage account. And with Gen2 storage account, what you can do is you can create multiple folders, multiple, or in other words, multiple containers. And within those folders, you can create subfolders as well. Okay. If I enable this, then what will happen? It will be called Gen2 storage account. And with Gen2 storage account, what can I do? I can have folders or in other words, containers. And within those containers, I can have subfolders or subcontainers as well. Okay, I can have subfolders or subcontainers as well. And within those subfolders, we can go ahead and store our files. Okay, so this is what happens in Gen2 storage account, wherein you can enable hierarchical namespace. Okay, so just like in our laptop, uh, we can have, we can create a folder within a folder. We can create subfolder and within this subfolder, we can upload our files. Similarly, uh, in Gen2 storage account, you can do that. Whereas if you don't enable this option, then what will happen? It will be called Gen1 storage account. And in Gen1 storage account, yes, you will be able to create multiple folders, multiple containers, but within those folders, you will not be able to create subfolders. You will directly be allowed to upload files only. Okay, remember that. So this is the difference between Gen 1 storage account and Gen 2 storage account. I will enable this option okay, of Gen 2 storage account. After that, the next option is called enable as SFTP. So if I check this, it will enable secure file transfer protocol, which allows you to securely transfer files over the network. Then next, you have this option called enable network file system. If I check this, this will enable the NFS v3 protocol or network file system v3 protocol, allowing your storage to be accessed like a network drive. Uh, so in pre in uh, many years back or many decades back, we used to have a network drives. Okay, and uh, if you want uh, your uh, storage account to be accessed like a network drive, then you can go ahead and select this option. It's up to you. Okay, uh, after that, the next option is allowing uh, is asking you to allow cross tenant replication. So this option when enabled allows the data in your storage account to be replicated across different Active Directory tenants for redundancy and better availability. OK, so uh, remember this. I, re I repeat this option when enabled allows the data in your storage account to be replicated across different Azure Active Directory tenants for redundancy and better availability. After that, you have the access to your option. You have two uh, uh, options to choose from within access tier. One is hot, another is cool. With hot tier, what happens is, remember hot tier is for data that uh, you access frequently, okay? So with hot tier, it's more expensive to store data. It's more expensive to store, but cheaper to access, expensive to store, but cheaper to access. Okay, on the other hand, the next option is pool tier. With pool tier, what will happen? Uh, pool tier is for data that you do not access often. So with pool tier, it's cheaper to store. It's cheaper to store, uh, but more expensive to access. Remember, based on this, a uh, question is usually asked in your DP900 examination. Okay, related to this access tier, a question is asked uh, in most of the question. Uh, in most of the uh, most of the times, question is asked. However, not all the times, but yeah, what I have observed is most of the times, question is asked. Okay, 
based on uh, this hot and cool tm okay fine after that the last uh, field is called enable large file trans uh, large file shares okay here uh, this option allows us to have uh, large uh, larger file shares than the standard ones anyways here it's automatically enabled uh, previously azure used to ask us whether to enable it or not but here you can see it's automatically enabled um, so it will allow large file shares as well so not a issue okay fine let me click on the next button and now it is allow asking me to choose settings for network connectivity okay so in this section you can define how your storage account can be accessed over the network the first option is called enable public access from all networks selecting this would allow enable on the uh, would allow anyone on the internet to potentially access your storage account if they have the right url and the right permissions the next option is enable public access from selected virtual networks and ip addresses this is a more secure option where you can specify exactly who can access your storage account by defining certain network or by defining certain ip addresses okay so let's say you only want people from your office to access your storage account then you will mention the ip addresses of your office employees and only your office employees will be able to access your storage account okay but still remember your uh, storage account will be accessed from the public network only from the public internet only okay however let's say if you want to use the private network then you can choose the third option okay this is the most secure option this disables any access from the public internet and allows access only through a private endpoint within azure okay uh, i will show you what is that endpoint on all of that don't worry about it. okay endpoint is nothing but a link through which you can access that particular resource. Okay, fine. Remember that with the third option, it's the most secure option. This disables access from the public internet and allows access only through private endpoint within Azure. Fine. I will choose the first option. Uh, however, remember the third one is the most secure one. Okay. After that, uh, next I'm being asked to choose settings for network routing. This determines how data gets to and from your storage account. First option is Microsoft network routing. By choosing this, you are opting for uh, you are opting to use Microsoft's global network infrastructure for routing, which can be more reliable and may op offer better performance. On the other hand, the second option is called internet routing. This option routes your traffic over the public internet rather than Microsoft's own proprietary network. It will use the public internet network rather than Microsoft's own proprietary network. Whereas with the first option, you're using the Microsoft's own proprietary network for routing. Okay, this is more secure. Uh, however, it's slightly costly as well, but it's more secure. It's up to you which option you want to choose. Okay, let me click on next button. And next it is asking me to choose settings for data protection. Remember based on uh, these settings, you do get questions asked in your DP900 examination. Okay. Uh, first option is called enable point in time restore for containers. Containers are nothing but folders, as I mentioned. So this is an option for protecting your data by allowing you to restore the data in your storage containers or in your storage folders to a previous state at a specific point in time. So let's say uh, you are doing some changes in the folder of your storage account or you're doing some changes in the container of your storage account. Now what you want to do is uh, you want to revert back to the state uh let's say uh at a specific point in time so for example you want to retrieve to a state uh to a point in time like let's say monday so let's say last monday at uh 7 pm how did your storage account look like at that state you want to revert back okay so if you want to do that you can go in and enable enable this with this what will happen is uh you can uh, restore data in your storage containers to a previous state at a specific point in time. Okay. Then next option is called enable soft delete for blobs. So when I check this, you can recover blobs. Blobs are, are nothing but binary large objects. You can uh, uh, think as blobs as nothing but files. Any file that you upload in your storage account will be called a blob. Okay. Full form of blob is binary large objects. Any file that you upload in your storage account will be treated as a blob. So let's say uh, you delete some files by mistake. What if you want to retrieve it back? Okay, 
uh, then you can go ahead and enable this option and you can set the days up to which you want to uh, keep your files in the recycle bin. OK, uh, so you can set the number of days. For example, I've set the number of days to seven. After seven days, uh, those deleted files will be removed even from the recycle bin. So then you won't be able to get your deleted files back. OK, what if you delete the entire folder, not the files? What if you delete the entire folder, you delete the entire container? OK, in that case, you can get that back as well. Again, just like previously, you can set the number of days up till which you want the uh, container to be remembered in the recycle bin. OK, let's say I've uh, set the value of seven. So up till seven days, it will remember it in the recycle bin. After seven days, even from the recycle bin, it will be removed. OK. After that, the next option is soft delete for file shares. OK, uh, now uh, remember that just like. Uh, uh, you can say. Uh, so when I turn this and if you delete a file share, now what is a file share? Uh, now, apart from storing files in your storage account, your storage account is also used to do many other things. One of the thing is efficient file share. OK, uh, how is it different and all of that? Uh, that's a different topic. But remember, apart from storing files, there's uh, another uh, feature of storage account, which is file share. OK, uh, so let's say you delete that file share by mistake and you want to retrieve it. You can get that back as well. It's up to you whether you want to enable that option or not. OK, after that, there are other tracking related settings. So one such setting is enable versioning for blobs. What does this mean? So if I change a file or if I change a blob, Azure can keep the older versions. So it's like having a history of your file changes. OK, so it's like having a history of your file changes. So if you want to enable versioning that OK, uh, uh, at this particular uh, time, uh, this was how the file looked like and so on. If you want to enable logs, uh, then you can go ahead and do that. So for example, in Google Drive, you do have the option of versioning. So just to show to you in Google Drive, in Google Drive, if I let's say create any file. Create any file. OK, let's say I've created this file. I can give it a version to it. I can call it version one. OK, like that, let's say I did. Some change now I can call this version two and so on. OK, and let's say I want to go back to any of my previous versions. I can go to version history, see my version history, and I can go to any version that are like version one, version two. OK, so how is it? How 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 is this versioning maintained with the help of logs right in the back end? Some logs might be maintained. So if you want to uh, allow this similar version in your storage account, uh, you can go ahead and enable this option. OK, fine. After that, the next option is enable block change feed. This keeps a uh, so remember the first option allows you to do allow allows you to have versioning just like you see in Google Drive, just like you see in Google Drive. Uh, I showed you showed to you right versioning. OK, fine. But what if you want to see the logs of those versioning? If you want to see those logs, you can go ahead and enable this second option with that. What will happen is uh, uh, it will keep a log of what changes were made to the files like when they were created, when they were modified, when they were deleted and all of that. OK, typically uh, what you should do is you should enable both of these things. OK, because you see in Google Drive, for example, in any file, it is keeping a track that if at this particular time, uh, this was the change that you made at that particular time. This was another change that you made and so on. This is done with help of logs. OK, so your, you can see a combination of versioning and log entries being kept. OK, if you want to do if you want to do both of those things, you have the option to enable both of those options in your storage account. After that, the last option is enable version level immutability support. What does this mean? Version level immutability support. This is a security feature that lets you lock file versions so they cannot be altered or they cannot be deleted. So let's say you have some uh, important file and you want to make sure that none of the uh, let's say all the employees in your office have access to the storage account. You have uploaded some file to your storage account, but you want to keep a lock on that file that by mistake, some other employee does not delete or do some modification in it. Then you can set that lock. OK, so there's a security feature over here that lets you. Uh, lock the file versions 
so they cannot be altered or they cannot be deleted so if you want to do it you can enable it it's up to you then click on the next button here it is asking me to choose encryption okay so uh, here it is asking me first uh, to choose encryption type so there are two options microsoft manage keys and customer manage keys so if you choose microsoft manage keys then what will happen microsoft will handle and manage the encryption keys for you it's easier because you don't have to worry about the uh, keys and all of that. You don't have to worry about maintaining and managing those keys. Whereas with customer managed keys, what happens is with customer managed keys, if you select this, then uh, you are saying that you want to control and manage the encryption keys yourself. This is for advanced users who have specific security requirements. Okay. Uh, so if you want to let man uh, Microsoft create the keys for you, and manage it for you. You can choose the first option. If you want to yourself manage the keys, you can choose the second one. However, I will uh, urge you to choose the first option only. The second option is more for advanced users who have specific security requirements. Okay. After that, the next field is asking me to enable support for customer managed keys. So let's say if you enable this option, then uh, this field will come into play. However, for us, this field will not come into play. OK, so it is saying that that customer managed key that you are creating, it will apply to which entities? It will only apply to files or will it apply to everything that you are storing in your storage account? OK, because uh, in your storage account, you can upload your files, you can upload your table, you can do many, many other things. OK, so you can go ahead and choose the option of your choice. But remember, this field only comes into play only if customer managed key option is selected. In our scenario, it's not selected. So this field will not come into play. After that, it is asking me to enable uh, infrastructure encryption. So this is an extra layer of encryption on top of the Azure managed or customer managed keys. If you turn this on, your data will be encrypted twice, which can make it even more secure. However, once this option is enabled for a storage account, it cannot be disabled back. So let me click on next option. Then next, it is asking me to choose stack configuration. Tags are nothing but name value pairs. Okay. So these are like labels that you apply to your Azure resources. Tag consists of two things. First is name and second is value. So uh, let's suppose that you create uh, multiple resources uh, in Azure. Now you want to search for some resources in a better way. Let's say you create 100 resources. You want to search for resources that you created for testing purposes. You want to search for resources that you created for production purposes. How can you do it? Well, you can assign tags for it. You can say that, OK, I'm giving it a tag for purpose that this particular resource I'm creating for which purpose for testing purpose. Okay. So let's say when uh, you will go to the resource group and when you want to search for a particular resource within your resource group, you can easily search for it using this tags. Okay. Uh, so here you can give any name, any value to your tags. It's up to you. Okay. So it will act as a label, and based on that label, it it will allow you to search for the resources in a much faster and better. Fine. However, if you don't want to do it, it's up to you. Anyways, over here in this particular lecture, I won't be creating multiple resources, so searching for resources won't be a big task. Okay. Uh, but let's say you're creating many, many resources, hundreds of resources at that time. It will be better if you assign tags to each of the resource. It will help you to better. Uh, it will help you to search for the resources in a better way. Next, let me click on next button. And now Azure is running a validation in the backend just to check whether it can give me the things that I'm asking for. If the validation is successful, the create button will be enabled. And you will see the validation is successful now. The create button has been enabled. Let me click on it. And with this, a resource of storage account service will be created. Remember that from here, normally one or two questions are asked in the examination, at least one, if not more. OK. Uh, so from the storage account service, one question is usually asked in your DP 900 examination. So things like network related settings, something like that, a question could be asked based on that. OK. Fine. All right, so. Uh, uh, remember the explanation uh, that I mentioned for every field uh, in that form that we saw. Okay, so remember it because based on that, questions are asked in your DP 900 examination. 
anyways in this lab what we are trying to do uh, my main intention was that i wanted to use i wanted to basically copy my data from github to storage account resource and i wanted i did not want to do it manually i don't know i wanted to do it with help of something called azure synapse service okay uh, with azure synapse service we'll do other things as well but this is the first thing that we are doing copying data from one place to another with azure synapse service we'll be able to uh, analyze the data we'll be able to transform the data also how to do it all of that we'll see so don't worry okay fine first thing done we have created the uh, storage account resource let me go to that resource and what i will do is uh, i will first create a folder in my storage account resource and in that folder i will want to have some files okay so let's go ahead and let's see how to do it so what i will do is i'll go to data storage here there is an option to create folders or containers let me click on it let me create a folder over here or let me create a container okay i will call it data and remember guys that we created a, a storage account called gen2 storage account not gen1 in gen1 storage account you cannot create subfolders within your folders however we have created gen2 storage account so in gen2 storage account you can see within your uh, a folder called data we can create a subfolder as well and you can see here there is an option to add a subfolder let me click on it let me call it csv with this what will happen is i have created a folder called data within this there is another folder called csv okay and here i can upload any files that i want fine what i want to do is in this lab what we'll be doing is we'll be sending data from github into a storage account resource and we'll be doing it with help of a service called azure synapse service okay let's see how to do it in order to use azure synapse service what i will have to do is i will have to create a resource of that service so let's go ahead and let's see how to create a resource of azure synapse service in order to do it i'll search for azure synapse in my search bar and click on the first option that pops up in the search result and now i will create a resource of azure synapse service remember i want to use the azure synapse service so in order to use it i will have to create a resource of that service so let's create a resource of it i'll click on the create button and when i do that i am redirected to a form that i have to fill so let's fill in the details of the form first field in the form is asking me to select subscription uh, make sure uh, remember that in your azure account you can have more than one subscription with different amount of money left in and whenever you are going to use any service of azure it will charge you something so make sure that you choose a subscription that has enough money left in it and it is uh, and it has enough permissions for you uh, to use that service uh, sometimes what happens is a subscription can be set in such a way that it has less permissions so for example let's say you are a, a ceo of a company and you want to give azure account to your employees then you will create different subscriptions for different people Uh, for a hr person you will create a different subscription uh, with different permissions okay uh, someone like a it employee will have a different subscription with different permissions and so on fine so make sure to choose the subscription of your choice in my scenario i have only one active subscription with me so i have no other option but to choose that one previously i had many active subscriptions in my uh, account but i disabled them fine but currently i have only one active subscription so let me choose that one after that it is asking me to choose the resource group for my resource uh, remember resource group helps for better management of resources so you can choose a existing resource group or create a new one let me choose a existing resource group the one that we created earlier okay after that it is asking me uh, uh, to choose uh, uh, your the next field that i see is manage resource group now this is an optional feature where azure will create a manage a resource group for you it is typically used for resources that uh, azure will create in the backend so let's say if we are going to do some task using the synapse service and uh, it might need creation of some resources in the backend uh, let's say it might need creation of a sql resource in the backend or something like that okay then instead of asking you to create the sql resource uh, it will automatically create it and all of the resources that it automatically creates it will put it inside a separate resource group called manage resource group okay so if at all 
let's say uh, azure is going to create some resources automatically uh, depending on your task then uh, those resources that it creates automatically it will put it in a separate resource group called manage resource group fine so you can give it a name if you do not give it a name what will happen azure will give it its own custom name okay azure will give it its own name fine however if you want to give a name of your choice you can go ahead and do it after that it is asking me to give a name to the storage account resource so let me give a name over here i will give it a name saying webinar synapse resource after that it is asking me to choose a region for my synapse resource so you can select any region of your choice make sure to choose a region closer to your user just for better latency okay after that it is saying that azure uh, after that it is saying that azure synapse resource needs to connect with storage account resource okay so it has made it mandatory now previously this was not the case previously uh, uh, Azure didn't ask you to link your Synapse resource with your storage account resource, but now it is asking you. So it is asking that uh, it is asking you to link it with a Gen2 storage account resource. Uh, and we have created a Gen2 storage account resource earlier, right? Just five ten minutes back, we did create a Gen2 storage account resource. Fine. So it is asking us to link with it. So we'll select that. Okay, we'll link it. We'll uh, link with it. How do you long, want to link with it? It's up to you. Whether you want to select it from the subscription through this drop down, or whether you want to do it with help of a link, or uh, or whether you want to do it with help of a URL, it's completely up to you. If you want to do it with help of URL, that's fine as well. How you, how would you want to do it? Let me go ahead and let me explain that to you. With help of a URL, how would you want to do it? Do okay. Let me show that. So what you would do is you will go to your storage account resource, the one that you have created. And that storage account resource will have a particular link. OK, and uh, for example, over here, uh, let me show that to you. Access keys. OK, here we see the access key somewhere. I should have the option to see its link as well. Somewhere over here. In some of the options, I will have the option to see its link as well. So over here, I'll have to see in which particular uh, option am I able to see its link. Uh, but once I am able to see its link, I'll be able to uh, connect with it as well. But fine. Currently, I am struggling to find that option. Not a worry. So since I'm struggling to find it, what I'll do is I'll not connect it with the URL. I'll connect it directly from my subscription over here. Fine. So I will say that, OK, uh, my storage account name is webinar storage res the one that i created earlier and uh, it is asking you to connect to a folder in that storage account resource so we have created a folder called data if you want to connect with it you can okay fine so over here we have connected to a storage account resource so previously this was not the case that synapse makes it mandatory to connect to storage account resource but now it has made it mandatory to connect to storage account resource that to gen 2 storage account resource okay why it has made it mandatory you will understand it ahead when we go forward oh anyways let's move forward and uh, now uh, let me click on the next button and now i'm being asked uh, to specify security okay so let's go ahead and let's understand these options first field is authentication method okay so this is where you select how you will authenticate or log in into the synapse workspace you have two options. Uh, first option is called use both local and Microsoft Entra ID authentication. This allows you to use both Azure's own identity service, previously known as Azure Active Directory, as well as a local username and password that you create. OK, so if you select the first option, then you will be able to use both Azure Active Directory. Uh, Azure Active Directory is now known as uh, Azure Entra. OK, previously it was known as Azure Active Directory. Fine. So this allows you to use both Azure's own identity service known as Azure previously known as Azure Active Directory and also a local username and password that you create. Okay. If you select the second option, it won't allow it won't ask you for a username and password. It will just use that uh, Azure Active Directory concept. The one that we saw in the slide.
Okay, sorry guys. I think I got disconnected in the middle. Uh, I heard that beep sound. That's when I came to know that I got disconnected in the middle. Uh, okay, uh, I'll just repeat it in case I missed something. And before going ahead, I uh, let me check some doubts in the chat. Over here, Bhavesh has asked, can you give an overview of what this Synapse workspace is? Yes, so Bhavesh, what Synapse will do is see. Uh, what Synapse does is it's a all-in-one uh, service, you can say. And what does Synapse do? It's an end-to-end data analytics service. Okay, it's an end-to-end -end data analytics service. So it will allow you to store your data. It will allow you to uh, analyze the data. It will allow, also allow you to transform the data. So all these three things with related to data management. See, when when I when you say that you want to manage the data, what are the three main things you will do? Store your data at some place. Second, analyze the data. Third, transform the data. Right. So Synapse allows you to do all these three things. So Synapse is that tool, is that one platform wherein you can do all these three things. See, there are some other services that does not allow you to do all the th three things. There are some services that just allow you to store the data. There are some services that just allow you to analyze the data. Okay. Uh, but let's say if you want an all-in-one service that allows you to store data, analyze data, and transform it, then uh, that can be done with help of Synapse. Okay. So with this, uh, Bhavesh, is that what you wanted to ask? Uh, in detail, we'll obviously study it, but this is just a brief overview that what does Synapse do? It uh, helps you to manage data. When you say manage data, it helps you to store data, analyze data, and transform data. Okay. In detail, obviously, the working and all this. Okay, Sh Shiv Kumar and Abbasi uh, have mentioned about. Okay, Abbasi has mentioned about uh, Synapse does not use ADFS. Uh, now, what is this ADFS? Uh, all of that will study. Okay, uh, for new users, uh, I won't talk about ADFS right now. This ADFS concept will come to use in the uh, in our lab. At that time, we'll study. Okay, right. Uh, with this, if there are any other doubts that you have, let me know. Up till now, is it being understood by everyone, guys? Shiv Kumar, Abbasi, Pavesh, Pradeep, everybody else? Yes? Okay, fine. Let's go ahead now. Let's go ahead. All right. So let's move forward. So uh, let me go ahead. Let, let me fill in the details over here. Uh, as I mentioned with the first option, you will use Microsoft Entra, which was previously known as Azure Active Directory. Uh, along with that, it will ask you to set a local username and password also. However, with the second option, it won't ask you to set a local username and password. It will just use that Entra concept, that uh, Azure Active Directory concept. Okay. Previously, Entra was known as uh, Azure Active Directory. Okay. Fine. So it's up to you. Up to you which option you want to choose. Okay. Uh, next, let's move forward. After that, uh, it is uh, if you want to set a local username and password, you can go ahead and set it. You can set the username, you can set the password also. It's completely up to you. However, I, I, I won't do it. Okay, let me keep it empty over here. Uh, fine. Next, it is asking me to allow network access to data lake storage Gen2 account. So I created that storage account resource, right? That Gen2 storage account resource. So it is asking me. Uh, to allow network access to it. Okay, so in this scenario, uh, let me keep it disabled only. I don't want to enable it. Let me keep it disabled only. That's fine for me. Okay, uh, the other options. Uh, next, it is asking me to use double encryption with customer managed key. Uh, well, I'm already doing encryption over here with help of I Entra and all of that. I don't want double encryption. Fine, I don't want double encryption uh, unnecessarily. Let me keep it as it is. Okay, let me click on the next button. Now it is asking me to choose settings for networking. So let me go ahead and let me choose settings for networking over here. Okay. Now, uh, there are many options shown to us. First is called managed virtual network. So if I enable this, this allows us to create a virtual network managed by Azure Synapse. A virtual network is like a private network in the cloud. 
where your synapse workspace and related resources are isolated and secured okay if you disable it uh, then what will happen uh, then manage virtual network will not be created and your workspace will be uh, less isolated from other azure uh, services right so it's up to you whatever you want to do if you want your resource to be inside of some virtual network that you are creating then you can go ahead and do it with that uh, what you can do is it's like virtual network is what it's like a private network in the cloud where your synapse workspace and related resources will be more isolated and more secure okay but with that a lot of other configuration i'll do i will have to do so i'll disable it i will say that okay i don't want to create a private virtual network i'm fine with the public network that we are using i'm fine with that okay do you want to allow connections from all ip addresses yes if you don't want to allow it disable it okay it's up to you i will say allow it from all ip addresses okay let me click on next button and now it is asking me to choose tag related configuration here i'll leave this empty i don't want to assign any tags whatsoever let me click on the next button and with this azure is running a validation in the back end just to check whether it can give me the things that i'm asking for if the validation is successful the create button will be enabled and now you can see it has been enabled let me click on it and with this what will happen is a resource of store synapse service will be created with this what will happen a resource of synapse service will be created let's wait for it let's wait uh, we'll have to wait for around 30 seconds or so and a resource of synapse service will be created for us We'll wait for a few seconds. Okay. Currently, I'm getting a bad request. It says deployment failed, additional details. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. What has failed? Okay. It seems some validation request failed. No issues. We'll do one thing. We'll create it again. Uh, maybe there's a availability issue on Azure site, or maybe some detail we missed. No worries. We'll create the resource again. Not an issue at all. Let's create the resource again. Let's create it again. I just want to check that uh, is my resource available inside my group? No, it was not created successfully, so I do not see it over here. Anyways, that's good. Okay, let me again create the synapse resource and over here this time when we'll create it, hopefully the availability issue. Uh, is not there and we are able to create it without any worries. Okay, let's go ahead. Let's give it a name webinar. Synapse resource. Okay, fine. All the other settings will do and we'll directly click on review plus create. And I will do one thing just so that uh, maybe in the previous region there was an availability issue. Let me select a different region then. Although fine, let me work with this uh, region itself. Let me check. Is it an availability issue with this region? Or some other issue? Because we have filled in all the required details. There is no... Uh, required detail that we left. We have filled in all the required details over here. We are fine with it. The validation was successful. If at all we did some mistake, then in validation only we would have got that error. Okay, it would not it would not have enabled the create button. Fine. Okay, workspace request validation failed. Again, we are getting some validation issue. Uh, it says, okay, let me read the notification. Additional details from underlying API. Okay, at least one result is Okay, oh, please see. Okay, for usage details. Okay, this slightly strange. Looks like a, a, a availability issue over here. Maybe in that region, I'm not able to deploy that resource. Let me select a different region. There is no uh, mistake uh, in the details that we have filled. Okay, if at all there was a mistake in the validation itself, I would have obtained an error. Fine, not an issue. Let's fill it again. Let's select a different region, something like South Central US.
Okay, fine. And I'm okay with this. Let me click on create button. Let's see if the availability issue still exists. If it still exists, we'll have to find another alternative. Let's check. Okay, so let's see. I will have to find another alternative for creating the resource. I have another alternative as well, so not over there. I just want to check whether the resource is deployed. Okay. Again, we are getting the error. So even after choosing a different region, still we are getting this error over here. Okay. So still uh, we are getting this error. This looks uh, Slightly worrisome because uh, over here, even after selecting a different region, we are getting this error. This looks slightly worrisome, not not a issue. Uh, not a issue over here. We'll do one thing: resource to deployment. So this particular resource group has failed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Some okay. There is no mistake in the filling of our form. It seems today uh, there is some issue with respect to availability. Not a worry. I can do one thing. I can create the Synapse resource in a different way as well. I can do it with help of code. So let me do that. Let me do it with help of code over here. Okay. Fine. So let me do it with help of code. Okay, I will just uh, let this uh, terminal set up. And once the terminal is set up, I'll show you what next to do. OK, now let's go ahead. So what I will do is I will just check uh, what all folders we have. OK, we have a DP203 folder. OK. Uh, let me go inside of this. Let me check. Okay, we have this all files folder. Let me go inside all files. Okay, we have the folder called labs. Let me go inside that folder. Okay, we have different different subfolders called 0, 1, 0, 2. Let me go inside the subfolder called 0, 1. OK, and what I have with me is I have this PowerShell script. This will go ahead and it will create the uh, Azure resource, Azure Synapse resource form. So let me go ahead and let me try to run it with code. Even after that, it's not working, then it's definitely some uh, Azure issue in the backend. Not a worry. Let's uh, do it with the alternative way. Not a worry. So we'll just say, please run this file called setup.ps1. Okay, I'll just try to go ahead and run it. Let's see. It will take some time to create uh, the required resources. So it will create the Synapse resource. It will also create the storage account resource, the one that we created manually. Fine. So it will do all of those things. It is asking us to put a password. Fine. So let's put a password over here. Okay. So over here, we have put a password. Fine. And over here, it is creating those resources for us automatically. Let's check with code is our resource creation working. Okay. You can create those resources manually or with help of code. Over here, I'm doing it with help of the code. Let's see. We'll have to wait for a few minutes, and soon those those resources should be created for us. Mm. Till then, what I will do is, uh, let me try uh, once more manually as well. Uh, although all the details we had entered, what uh thing we could have missed? 
what thing we could have missed. Everything we entered over here, there was no thing. There was nothing that we left as such. Let me give it a name. Okay, region is fine. Uh, it is asking me to connect to storage account resource. Fine for security. Authentication method. Fine. I even if I leave it blank, that's OK as well. It's not necessary as such, but let me enter a password. Although it's not a mandatory field, but let me enter it. The rest everything is fine and not an issue. Even networking settings were fine over here. Even tag related settings, I didn't do anything. And then I asked Azure to review the details entered by me. If the validation was successful, create button would have been enabled. Let me click on it. Let's see whether I'm able to create a resource manually or not. If still there's an availability issue while creating creating it manually, anyways, I have I'm anyways creating it with the help of the code. So our lab will not suffer. This is that I wanted to show you the complete creation manually. Okay, there must be some availability issue in the backend. Let's check. Again, deployment failed. Okay. Uh, Smith, uh, just yes. one thing. Uh, so there are some chats. Uh, can you check it? Okay. So manage okay. resource one group, second. That particular column is missing, like the DSA. No, no. Uh, it's fine. Even if we don't give it, Azure will give its own uh, name. Uh, it's not a mandatory field. Uh, let me check the Azure chats. Mm, Central India is working. Acha, Jaykesh is saying Central India is working. Okay. Let me check with that. See if Central India is working. Central India. Mm. Let me check with that Central India. Where is it? Let me go above or below Central India. You said mm, not Central US, right? Central India. Huh, this is the one. Okay, fine. Let's see with this uh, region. Hopefully, there is no availability issue. Rest everything is fine. If I leave it default, not a worry. Okay, even if I leave this manager resource group named. Uh, Empty the, uh, Azure will give its own name to that managed resource group. What is a managed resource group? It's a resource group wherein you, uh, uh, so whatever resources Azure will create automatically. Okay, let's say for your task that you're doing in Synapse, uh, Azure might need to create a SQL resource automatically. Well, whatever resources it creates automatically, it puts it inside of a separate resource group called managed resource group. And if you don't give a name to the managed resource group, Azure will give its own name, not a worry. Fine. Rest of the things, let me leave it default. Security detail, let me leave it default. Networking details, tag related details, everything, let me leave it default. Validation, huh? Your validation error we are getting. Let's see. Huh? We forgot to give a name to our storage account resource or our. Uh, so let me give it a name. I will give it a name saying webinar synapse res. Let me choose a different name. OK. Hopefully now no validation issue because if at all we did some mistakes, then you can see we get a validation issue. So the fact that we did get a validation issue earlier, that means there was no issue in our, uh, you know, detail filling. OK. So all the details that we filled were correct. The only issue I see is availability issue. And uh, this is the first time I observed it with Synapse. I do observe it with other services of Azure that we suffer from uh, availability issues like uh, the AI services that are available in Azure. They do suffer from availability issues, but this is the first time I'm seeing it in Synapse. Okay. But let's see if with a different region it works. As one student mentioned, uh, he is able to create the resource in Central India. Let's see in Central India whether it's working. I have not got an error up till now. Let's see in Central India whether it worked or not. 
Okay, I have not got an error. This suggests that maybe Jaikesh is right. And Central India region is working. Okay, so West US region didn't work, South Central US didn't work. Let's check with Central India region, as Jaikesh mentioned. Remember, manage resource group field is not mandatory. If you leave it empty, even then it's fine. Okay, if I don't give a name to the managed resource group, Azure will give its own name. So that's not a worry. Fine, let's wait. Hopefully, I, have, I mean, I have not got an error up till now. So that suggests that the region that JK suggested is the correct region. Yes, as JK mentioned. Central India might be a correct region. This is the first time I observed it in Synapse. Uh, I do observe it in other services of Azure, uh, these availability issues, but this is the first time I've seen it in Synapse. So a little strange. Azure is struggling a lot in the recent months. Okay. Because usually when I take lectures on uh, the Azure AI services, at that time we do get these availability issues. But fine. And this is the first time I've seen it with Synapse. This is something that they will have to uh, correct soon. But regardless of where I choose the region, it should allow me to create this. But fine. Anyways, to proceed ahead, it seemed that with West US resource, uh, with, with West US region, there was some issue with the servers. Even in South Central US, there was some issue. But as JK suggested, Central India region is working and I have not got an error up till now. So it seems that Central India region might work. Let's wait. With Central India. And over here, I'll just minimize this. Uh, now there is no need for me to create resources with help of code. Okay, I can, I am able to do it manually, it seems. With help of Jaikesh, the region that he suggested, we are able to do it manually. So not a worry. So although in the background, even with code, we are creating the resource. Okay, but there is no need for it anyways. Manually, we are able to do it. Okay, we'll have to wait for a few more seconds for the resource creation to be completed. And then we'll see what to do next. Okay, till the resources uh, getting created, let me ask you guys some questions. So let me ask some question to Pradeep. So Pradeep, please help me out since I've all, uh, already unmuted your mic. So I'm asking a question to you. So Pradeep, uh, first, what did we do today, buddy? First, we created a resource of storage account service. Uh, what is storage account service? What does it help us to do? Uh, storage account uh, service basically to store all the files and uh, we can uh, store uh, various types of files. That is one thing. And uh, yeah, so we can we can use it for our uh, projects. Correct. Uh, uh, so it's just like your Google Drive, just like in Google Drive, you can store any type of files in storage account. You can store any type of files. There are a lot of other things that storage account does as well, but this is one of the things that it does. Yes. Okay. Fine. Uh, so, buddy, uh, Pradeep, in storage account, there were two types of storage accounts that you can create, Gen 1 storage account and Gen 2 storage account. Yes. What is the difference between the two? Okay. Um, in Gen 1 storage account, we can't create multiple folders, but in Gen 2 uh, storage account, we can create a folders within another folder. Okay. So remember guys that in as uh, Pradeep mentioned in Gen 1 storage account, you can create folders and remember you can create multiple folders. It's not an issue. It's just that within a folder, you cannot create a subfolder. Okay. Within a folder, you cannot create a subfolder. Okay. So in Gen 1 storage account, you can create multiple folders, not an issue. Okay. It's just that in Gen 2 storage account, you can create a subfolder within a folder as well. Okay, so that's the difference that Gen2 storage account allows for hierarchical namespace. And when I say hierarchical namespace, what does, what does it allow? It allows us to create subfolders within folders as well. Okay, within subfolders, you can have more subfolders. And within those, you can upload your files. 
okay so uh like that you can proceed in your gen2 storage account fine all right so in gen1 storage account yes you can create multiple folders but as pradeep mentioned you cannot create sub folders within a folder you cannot create sub folders within it. okay so in gen1 storage account it does not follow hierarchical namespace whereas in gen2 storage account it does follow hierarchical namespace okay fine let's go ahead and let's uh, move on to another thing so after storage account uh, resource we went on to create another resource which was synapse resource right and over here this is the synapse resource that we created this is the synapse resource that we created over here okay uh, pradeep what does synapse resource help us to do um basically it helps us to um, transform the data and store the data and do yes. the analytics perfect it helps us to do all the three things related to data management it helps you to store the data it helps you to analyze the data it helps you to transform the data all the three things okay fine and you might wonder right pradeep why does storage account require a link sorry why does synapse resource require a link with storage account resource correct when i try to create a synapse resource didn't it ask to link it to storage account resource yes yes why because when i say synapse allows you to store analyze and transform so when you store any data in synapse where it will be stored synapse is linked with storage account so by default it will be stored in storage Gen account two. only correct correct so yes synapse does allow you to store but when you store anything in synapse indirectly where it will store it in your storage Check. account resource okay fine similarly when you want to analyze what will happen all of that we'll see when we want to transform what will happen we'll see okay so if anybody asks you pradeep why does synapse require a link with storage account resource why because i want to transform the data in, the, in that particular scenario i need to use this option uh, or, or we can say that if i want to store any data in my uh, using my synapse resource yes we'll be able to store the data using the synapse resource but indirectly that data will go where in my storage account resource only. okay i will show you how Fine. I'll show you how. Fine. Uh, so storage account resource. Remember, it will act as uh, the place where uh, uh, which will store all the data of Synapse. Fine. Anyways, uh, there are other things that Synapse can do can to store your data as well. I'll, I will show you all of that. Fine. Anyways, so first resource that we created today was storage account resource. Second resource that we created today was Synapse resource. Now. If I want to work with Synapse, I will have to open the Synapse Studio. So let me open Synapse Studio over here. I will go ahead and open it. And now once I open it, I'll show you what to do next. So I've opened my Synapse Studio. I'm opening it. Within a few seconds, it will open up. Okay, and I will explain to you what is shown to you on the Synapse Studio. Okay, let me try to sign in again to the Synapse Studio. And then I'll show you what to do next. It is loading. It seems a little slow. Usually it does not take this much time, but fine, it has loaded. Okay, on the left hand side, in the left hand side menu, you can see various options. First option is called Home. This is the main dashboard or the starting point where you can see an overview of your Synapse environment including recent resources and quick links to create and manage resources. Okay. Uh, then next is data. The second option in the menu is data. This section allows you to manage and explore your data. This could include browsing databases, uploading in new data sets, or exploring data through various data explorers that are provided by Azure. The third option is develop. This is the area where you can write, run, and manage code. Okay this is where you can write run and manage code so you can create and manage scripts notebooks or other development artifacts necessary for protecting or uh, sorry necessary for processing and uh, analyzing your data next you have this option called integrate 
this is this would be where you manage and create data integration pipelines so here you can design processes that extract data from various sources transform the data and then load it into your data warehouse or other storage solution so if you want to create an automatic pipeline that does all of those things you can do create that automatic pipeline over here okay next you have this monitor section in this section what you can do in this section we can monitor the health and activity of your uh, Synapse environment. So you can view and diagnose the performance of your pipelines, queries and other activities. OK, uh, so whether the pipeline that you created, whether it's healthy or not, if there or it has some issue occurred in the pipeline and all of that. Next, you have this manage section. This section is likely for uh, overall management settings for your uh, Synapse workspace. This could involve managing security, compute, networking settings, or other necessary administrative tasks. OK, so just to recap over here, uh, let me ask a question to one of you. Let me ask that question to Jaikesh. So Jaikesh, I will unmute your mic and please help me over here. So Jaikesh, I've unmuted our mic right now. And Jaikesh, if possible, please help me. Yes, sir. Yes, so Jaikesh, over here, we just walked through the options on the left hand side menu. First is data. So, with this, what can you do? Uh, so, the data here is uh, creating a pipeline. Sorry, it's an integration, it's a pipeline. Uh, no, no. With this option, buddy, what happens is you can manage and explore your data. Okay. So let's say you uh, want to include browsing. Uh, let, uh, so let's say you want to browse databases. You want to upload new data sets. You want to explore data through various data explorers that are provided by Azure. You can go ahead and do that over here. We'll be okay, so, uh, okay. Ah. so IR and link services uh, can be created here, right? Correct, correct, yes. I, yes. IR and link services, okay. Correct, yes. Uh, and you can see there's an option for that link services. Correct. Correct. So okay. we can connect with the uh, ADLS or any other uh, da data sources. Perfect. Right. Correct. You can do that. Yes, absolutely. So that is the correct explanation that Jaikesh gave. Okay. Moving on to the next option, Jaikesh, develop. Here, what can you do? Mm. Not sure about. Uh... Yes. So here... ah. Okay. Okay. So here, after link service is created. So we need to create a data flow that should be linked with uh, uh, the link services. So here, ah, so, mm -hmm. so data Correct. flow is uh, here to need to be created uh, for the any uh, pipeline uh, before pipeline uh, creation. Uh, okay. Uh, even without a uh, pipeline, buddy, what happens is let's say you uploaded your data. Okay, you have uploaded your data over here. Now you want to analyze it. You will analyze it through some code whether Python code or some other code. So you will create a coding file and this is where you can create a coding file for that. Okay. Okay. Uh, if you are aware about Python programming language, we have a something called notebooks, Jupyter notebook, Google Colab notebook, right? Correct. Yeah. Right. So you can create those Python notebooks over here. Fine. And in notebooks, it's not just Python code that you can write. You can write code in other languages like R and all of that. Fine. Anyways. Uh, so let's say uploaded your data, then you want to analyze it. For that, you will write some code. You will create the coding files for that over here in the develop section. Then in integrate section, what you want to do? Let's say you want to create pipelines, which are nothing but a automatic process uh, that will extract the data from one place, transform the data, and then load it into some other place. So that entire automatic pipeline you want to build. OK, the, that entire pipeline pipeline is nothing but a set of processes, set of processes. So one process could be loading the data. Another process could be transforming the data. Then third process could be pushing the data to some other place. OK, so let's say you want to execute the set of processes in a single go. Well, you can do it with help of pipeline. OK, and you can go ahead and uh, create those pipelines in the integrate section. OK, you can yes, create correct. it in the yeah. integrate section. OK, then in the monitor section, what can you do? So here, if any pipeline is failed, so that we can see here why it failed and we can debug it. 
Uh, right. So here in monitor section, as uh, Jake has mentioned, it's for monitoring the health and activity of your synapse environment. So you can view the and diagnose the performance of your pipelines, of your queries, or any other activities that you are performing. Okay. So let's say you run some SQL code. And you are requesting to run that SQL code. So it will be activity. You can monitor the health of that as well. So fine. You can monitor uh, the, uh, you can view and diagnose the performance of your pipelines, queries, or any other activities. Okay. Fine. And in the manage section, what happens, Jaykesh? So manage here is uh, all our, uh, uh, what IR and other things are should be placed here to change it or integrate it. Ah, so administrative tasks, right? Correct. So for example, uh, let's say I want to run code, but that code will run on some machine. Uh, I mean, it will run on some machine. So you can create, uh, you can assign those machines over here that that machine will have a RAM of what it will have a memory of what and all of that. But now how to do all of it, I'll show that to you. Don't worry. Okay. Fine. So you're in the manage section. Uh, this uh, for overall management settings of your Synapse workspace. This involves managing security, compute, networking settings, or other administrative tasks. Okay. Fine. Anyways, with this, we had an overview of the six options that are shown to you over here. Fine. Now, uh, thank you, Jaykish, for your help. Uh, I'll just uh, mute everyone. Uh, thank you. So with help of Jaykish, we revised. Uh, the various uh, or menu options that were shown to us on the left hand side. Right now, uh, let's move forward. And uh, what we'll do is uh, let's understand how can we uh, run or how can we, let's say, perform any analysis on Synapse. Yes, Synapse is used to store data, so we can use it to store data. We can use it to perform analysis uh, and we can use it to perform transformation as well. Okay. Now, whatever activity we are performing, whatever activity we are performing, it will run on some machine, it will run on some server. Okay. So, here in Synapse, it gives you an option to create a group of servers, to create a group of servers called as pool. Okay. To create a group of servers called pool. Now there are two types of pools that you can create. First is built-in pool. Okay, second is dedicated pool. First is built-in pool. Second is dedicated pool. So let's go ahead and let's understand about it. Okay, so let me go to pool section and uh, uh, let me show that to you. So guys, there are main two types of pools that it offers. Within SQL pool, it gives you an option to create a built-in SQL pool and a dedicated SQL pool. Okay, what is the difference between the them? I'll explain that, don't worry. Dedicated SQL pool. Then you have a Spark pool as well, in which you can only, uh, this is uh, nothing but a set of servers only in which you can run Spark code. Okay, in SQL pool, you can run your code in SQL language. Uh, whereas Spark pool is a group of servers where you can write a uh, run code only in Spark. Okay. Fine. Within SQL pool, you have two options. First is built-in SQL pool. Second is dedicated SQL pool. Let me show that to you. Let me show that. So if I go to manage section and you can see in SQL pool, there is an option to create a pool. It has already created a built-in SQL pool. Okay. Uh, built-in SQL pool. So what is built-in SQL pool? And secondly, it allows you to create a, a dedicated SQL pool as well. So what is the difference between a built-in SQL pool and a dedicated SQL? Let's see. So in built-in SQL pool, what happens guys, when you are running SQL code, at that time, at that time, Azure will search for a server. Okay, at that time, Azure will search for a server. It will find that server for you. And just for running the code, it will give you that server. Once the code run has completed, then again, that server will not be available to you. Again, that server will not be available to you. So, uh, Pradeep, can I say in built-in SQL pool, uh, yes, a pool is given to you, 
but only for a temporary time can i say that pradeep yes yes only for temporary time so you tell me buddy if anything is given us for temporary time so can can it happen buddy that let's say uh, when i ran, ran my first sql code uh, let's say one server was given uh, uh, then let's say half an hour later when i ran the sql code then some other server was given to me possible um yes possible huh? okay so can i say server that is given to you is not fixed and the server that is given to you is also temporary it is yes. temporary okay so with built in sql pool will you be able to, yes you can write sql code but will you be able to write sql code that uh, uh you know stores data for example create table is a sql command create table basically helps you to create a table it helps you to create some data which is in the format of a table so with built in sql pool will you be able to store that table what do you think yes uh, but that server is given to you for temporary time so if yes. you create the table then that server will be lost na so how will you be able to access that server again yes i got so it. with built in sql pool what happens uh, pradeep is you will you will not be able to run any commands that uh, does uh, that uh, you know creates the data or does any changes in the data all you can do is analyze the data okay, okay. so all you can do is run those select commands okay right uh, so you can run those select commands and all of that so you can analyze uh, you can run commands that does analysis but any command that you know creates the data for you or does any changes in the data so all those ddl commands and all those dml commands they ddl commands is data definition language command a dml command is data manipulation language command so example of dml is update right update query in sql it's a dml command okay fine so all those commands we will not be able to run it in built in sql pool why because the server that is given to you is for temporary time okay it is just given to you for running the sql code once the sql code has run that server will not be available to you okay so that is what happens in built in sql pool so uh, in dedicated sql pool what happens is that pool of servers that are given to you they are given to you for a uh, i mean uh, those servers will be available to you only okay so it's like hiring a personal car hiring a personal car okay whereas built in sql pool is like uh, uh, having a ola or a uber okay so let's say i'm using uber right now for one hour then later that uber will be used by somebody else then again uh, two five hours later that uber will be used by somebody else and so on okay so uber is not your personal car there is a dedicated sql pool is like a personal car okay uh so uh, just like we can do anything on a personal car we can uh, do any changes right uh, similarly in your dedicated sql pool you can choose the settings of your choice that how do you want the dedicated sql pool to be and the main benefit is here you will be able to run all the commands the create table commands so you will be able to run ddl commands then dml sql commands and all the other commands so all the commands you will be able to run okay whereas in built in sql pool you are not able to run those ddl commands the ml commands okay you are only able to run uh, those analysis commands like select table command and all of that so any command that does uh, that creates the data or does changes in the data you are not able to do in a built in sql pool whereas in a dedicated sql pool you are able to okay so just to recap in built in sql pool yes you have a group of servers in dedicated sql pool also you have a group of servers okay why do we have a group uh, well the intention is let's say if you are doing a task okay let's say your office has given a task to you if you do the task alone on your own you might take a lot of time on the other hand if you have a team of people doing the exact same task that task can be done in a much faster manner okay so just like that let's say if we have uh, if we are wanting to execute a query if 
I just use one server to execute the query. That server could take a lot of time. So instead, why don't we have a group of servers? And when the execution comes, uh, that uh, execution task will be divided across the servers so that uh, uh, the execution is done in a much faster manner. Okay, fine. So remember in built-in SQL pool, yes, you have a group of servers. In dedicated SQL pool, yes, you have a group of servers. It's just that in built-in SQL pool, that server is just given to you for temporary purpose and it's only available to you when you are running the uh, code. So let's say when you are running the code at that time, Azure will search for a server and then it will give to you for execution. Okay, so it will built in SQL pool will not be available to you uh, uh, fully. Okay, it will only be available to you only during, uh, uh, only when you are running the code. Okay, whereas dedicated SQL pool will be available to you all the time. Okay, fine. So you can create a dedicated SQL pool if you want to over here. I will give it a name. Let me call it dedicated SQL pool. Let me call it webinar dedicated SQL. Fine. You can select the performance level over here. Okay. Uh, here, if you see, uh, it's asking you to choose the performance level in terms of DWU. DWU stands for data warehousing units, okay, which represent a blend of compute, memory, and input output resources. So adjusting the slider changes the DWUs and affects the performance and cost of the SQL. So in one DWU, how much uh, compute, how much uh, memory, how much input output resources are given, that is not declared by Azure. Okay, that's not publicly available information. But remember, one DWU, it comprise of three things, compute, storage, and input output resources. Okay, fine. But how much of compute is available in one DWU? How much of storage is available? That is not publicly available information. Azure has not released it. Okay, so what it does is to encapsulate all these details, it has just mentioned this term called DWU. And uh, if you increase DDW, uh, basically the performance increases. Okay. So remember, one DW is a combination of three things compute, storage, and input and output resources. Okay. Fine. So uh, you can change the performance level. With that, the cost will also change. Okay. So remember that. Fine. So you can choose anything of your choice. Completely up to you. Let me select this. Okay, this is fine for me. Okay, uh, let me create the dedicated SQL pool. I have clicked on the create button to create it. And with this, uh, within a few seconds, it should be created. Or within a few minutes, rather, it should be created. Fine. So this was about SQL pool. Similarly, we have Spark pool. Okay. Now, in Spark pool, guys, in Spark pool over here, uh, unlike SQL pool, where you had two options, right? Uh, you had built in SQL pool, you had a dedicated SQL pool. In Spark pool, you have only one option, which is dedicated Spark pool. You don't have that built in Spark pool option. Okay. Here you only have one option, which is dedicated Spark. Pool. So, here you can, if you want to create a Spark pool, you can go ahead and do it. The difference between SQL pool and Spark pool is that in S with SQL pool, uh, you get a group of servers on which you can write in, uh, on which you can run SQL code. Whereas with Spark pool, you can you have a group of servers in which you can run Spark code. Okay, fine. And you can run Spark code in multiple languages, including Python, Scala, and multiple languages. Okay, but anyways, so just to recap, so Jaykesh in uh, SQL pool, you have two options. A uh, built in SQL pool and dedicated SQL pool. Whereas Jaykesh in Spark pool, do you have two options? Jaykesh, what do you think? Uh, in Spark pool, do you have two options? Not, uh, I think, I think miss, miss, uh, miss it. Achha, you missed it, Achha, no issues. Yeah. So, Jaykesh, what we uh, saw was that, okay, uh, if I want to do any task uh, in Synapse. Uh, that task will happen on some server at the end of the day. 
okay Correct. so what yeah. synapse does is it allows you to hire a group of servers for your task that group of server is known as what it is known as a pool okay it is known as a pool so there are two type of pools that azure allows you to create first is sql pool second is spark pool within sql pool you can run code in sql language within spark pool you can run code that is written in spark okay that is written based on spark okay now within sql so python, pool you have so, no, ah. so notepad and no, notepad and python i can uh, run in a spark correct correct so for notepad. python hmm. right then for scala all of those code you will run on spark pool okay whereas sql code you will run on sql pool and if i show to you just to prove hmm. your sentence you yeah, absolutely correct and just to prove it to you let's say i create a notebook file and can you see it's allow it's asking me to attach to a spark pool over here yes yes so if i want to run code in python it will first ask me to attach to a spark okay fine so as we mentioned uh, as far as pools are concerned pool is nothing but a group of servers so there are two type of pools that you can create sql pool and spark pool with an sql pool there are two options built in sql pool and dedicated sql what is the difference between the two jaykesh so uh, here in a sql here we can do the only select query other things in built in and dedicated pool we can do the all the crude operations ha huh, correct so with built in sql pool what happens is only at the time when you are running the code only at that time azure will search for some server Uh, or a group of servers it will search for and those group of servers it will give to you for code execution once the code execution is done then again those group of servers won't be available to you okay so that means the group of servers that are available to you is only available for a temporary period of time because of this let's say if you want to do things like create table command update table command insert table insert into table command all of those commands you won't be able to do. okay so all of those ddl sql commands dml sql commands you won't be able to do only basic analysis commands like select query and all of those related commands you can do okay uh, whereas in dedicated sql pool you can run all type of commands ddl commands dml commands any sql command you can run okay fine so remember that uh, in spark pool jaykesh do we have two types built in and dedicated uh no no we only have one type which is dedicated spark pool okay yes. we only have one type which is dedicated spark pool okay so whatever spark pool you create it will be available to you uh, for the full time fine all right thank you jaykesh so with help of jaykesh we revise uh, the we revise uh, the concept of pools okay up till now if there is any doubt do let me know let me check the chat if i have missed anything saravanan says temporary server is called serverless okay so saravanan here basically the term serverless means yes that uh, the server is not available to you for a fixed duration that is one okay it's not it's not available for a, i mean it's not available to you fully only during your task the server will be given to you otherwise you will be left without a server so can i say that saravanan that only when you are running the code only then the server is given to you right otherwise you are left without a server so you are serverless you are without a server okay so only when you are running the code at that time the server is given to you so you only be you will only be charged for that particular time you will only be charged when you are running the code okay whereas in dedicated sql pool even though you are not running the code but still you are hiring the server na so still you will have to pay the rent even though you are not doing anything on the server but still you will have to pay some rent okay so with serverless sql pool the benefit is what that you only get charged for what you for what the task you are doing let's say you are running a code only for that you will be charged because when you are running the code only then the server is given to you otherwise you are not lot left with any server make sense saravanan that in built in sql pool only during code running the server is given to you however otherwise the server is not given to you okay you are not left with server 
after the code has run, the code has completed its execution, you are not left with any server. Make sense, Saravanan or no? Any doubt? Uh, Abbasi has a doubt. Abbasi says, uh, only data pipeline, not application. Ha, yes, only data pipeline. Yes, correct. Ha, right. So as uh, the Abbasi has mentioned the term ETL, ETL stands for extract transform load. So you extract the data from one place, transform it into some format and load it into some other place. So I mentioned those the data processes, right? So those you can do. Yes, so uh, data pipeline is the right word. Yes, not application pipeline. Synapse is not used to manage applications. Synapse is used to manage data. So everything is related to data only, not related to application. Okay. Uh, Pradeep says, if we have Azure VM, then can we use that instead of SQL pool? Ha. Huh. So now when you are creating uh, uh, now, sometimes see in what happens is in some services, it does allow you to attach a separate server that you have created. Let's say you have created a separate virtual machine. It allows you to integrate that. So you might see that option in, in this service called Azure ML service. Okay, even there we have a concept of pools and there it allows you that, okay, if at all there is some other servers that you have created on your own, you can integrate those servers over here in Azure ML. But in Azure Synapse, that option is not given to you, Pradeep. Okay, that option is not given to you. So the question that you are asking, it does not apply to Synapse. But yes, that option, that feature is available in some other services of Azure. That let's say in Azure ML service, where you can run machine learning code, there you will have, you will need to have a pool, uh, you will need to create a pool, okay, uh, which is nothing but a group of servers. So at that time, it will allow you to create the pool or it will allow you to uh, integrator already existing pool that you have created before. Okay. So yes, that is available. That feature is available in some services of Azure. However, in Synapse service buddy, that feature is not available. Okay. However, in Synapse service, that feature is not available. Remember that. Okay. Fine. Uh, now let's go ahead. And what we'll do is we'll save all the changes that we have done. Uh, any coding file we have created. In fact, let me not save it. Let me close this. Okay. If at all I do any changes, what will happen? You you will see that you will get a button called publish, which is nothing but another way of saying save. Okay, publish or save one and the same thing. So what if at all I do any change? Let uh, you will see over your publish button will be enabled. Okay, and it says that one change has been made. You can see the number one next to it. Okay. Fine. Let's go ahead. So we have seen the concept of pools. Okay. Uh, there are two types of pools, SQL pool and Spark. And you know the difference between the two. Now let's go ahead and let's do our main task. What is our main task? Our main task over here was to copy the data, right? Copy the data from one place to another. Let's go ahead and let's see how to do it. Okay. So we'll go ahead and we'll see how to do it. So let's say I want to build a pipeline like this. Extract the data from one place. It could be GitHub. If I want to do transformation in the middle, I can do that over here. Not an issue. Okay. Uh, however, transformation is uh, not uh, mandatory. It's up to you whether you want to transform it or not. But it is not mandatory. It's optional. Okay. After that, I want to load it into my uh, storage account resource. So I want to extract the data from GitHub. In between, if you want to transform it, you can, and then load it into storage account resource. How can you do that? Let's go ahead and let's see. So what we are doing over here, we are building a pipeline, okay? And in order to build this simple and pipeline, if you go to home button, there is this option called ingest available. You can do it. It's a shortcut to create a pipeline. However, you can create a pipeline from the integrate section as well. Okay. However, in the home section, uh, see these type of labs like copy data from one place to another. It's a very common pipeline that many developers build. Okay. So for that, a shortcut is given on the home page section. However, if you want to create it on the integrate section, even that is fine. Not an issue at all. Okay. Fine. Uh, so let me show to you. 
uh, how to work with it. Okay. Let's say you want to create a pipeline and how to do it. But before that, I think it's better if we take a 10 minute uh, break. And after that, we'll be fresh and we'll see our first pipeline of today. So guys, up till now, whatever we are seeing, is it making sense? So whatever, whatever uh, work we did, we saw the explanation behind that work. Making sense, I guess? Yes, okay. Okay, Pradeep has asked for a break. Okay, so yes, let's take a break. Rago, yes, okay. Fine. So let's take a break of around uh, 10 minutes. We'll be back after that. We'll be fresh and then we'll see the working. So let's take a 10 minute break guys, and then we'll come back. Till then I'll just keep my mic on mute.
Welcome back to the session, everyone. Hope all of you are back after the break. Before we go ahead, uh, let me look at the doubts in the chat. So Riddhi has asked the question. Riddhi says, currently Riddhi is in the first year, so the concepts might be a little confusing for her. Yes, Riddhi, I agree with that. The thing is, uh, before uh, you focus on DP 900 concepts, I would urge you to cover this certification called AZ 900. With that, what will happen is all these terms that I'm mentioning will be more clear to you. Okay. So, Riddhi, once you cover AZ 900, then you go to DP 900. Okay. AZ 900 will cover the basic, basic terms that I'm talking about. Okay. So, if I talk the uh, if I talk about a term availability zone, all of that, um, I mean, most of the explanation will be covered under OER. Okay. Uh, but still, uh, if you have doubts, what I can do is, Riddhi, I can unmute your mic. And if at all you have doubts, uh, you can ask me or uh, let's revise with your help. Uh, and in that process, if you have some doubts, that will also be clear. Okay, so Riddhi, I've uh, allowed you to unmute your mic. Riddhi, is Riddhi there? Yes. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon. So yes, Riddhi, uh, let's revise and in between, if you have some doubts, if you are not asked to anything, let me know, I'll repeat it back for you, not an issue. Okay, so first, sure. Riddhi, what did we do? Uh, we created a resource of which service in Azure? Riddhi, we created a resource of which service in Azure? Do you remember? Uh, I remember firstly we created uh, something uh, relating to storage and uh, it was regarding authentication. Ah, storage account, right. We created a resource of storage account service. Right, perfect. What does uh, this resource do? What does this resource help us to do? Uh, what is the purpose of creating this resource? Storage account. So there was a uh, storage, storage account, account is uh, yes, basically for accessing data or something. Okay, to store data, right? Yes. So Riddhi, just like we have Google Drive, in Google Drive, can you store any type of files? Can you store any type of files in Google Drive? Yes, right? We can store any type of files in Google Drive. Similarly, in storage yes. account, you can upload any type of files. So you can think of storage account as an alternative of Google Drive. Just like in Google Drive, we can store any type of files. In storage account, you can store any type of files. And in storage account, the files are known as what? Another word for files is blobs. Okay, remember that. But anyways, just like in Google Drive, you can upload any type of files. In storage account, you can upload any type of files. Okay, fine. There are two ways in which you can create a storage account. One is Gen 1 storage account, Riddhi, and another is, another is Gen 2 storage account. Riddhi, what is the difference between the two? Difference between Gen 1 storage account and Gen 2 storage account, Riddhi. Any difference you remember? It might be wrong, not a worry. Is this that with this, your uh, concept will get more clear, that's all. Difference between Gen 1 and Gen 2 storage account. Riddhi? One second, maybe someone has mentioned uh, it in yes. the chat. Ah. Ah, so, Riddhi, any difference between Gen 1 and Gen 2 storage account? According to you, it might be wrong, not an issue. It's fine. Uh, it's still your first day learning this. You might create some, uh, you might do mistakes. According to you, what is the difference? According to me, uh, it's uh, based on uh, system security. Okay. 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 Uh, so main difference, Riddhi, is this, that in Gen 1 storage account, you can create multiple folders. Uh, another word for folders in storage account is containers. So you can create multiple folders or multiple containers. Okay. But within 
in those folders you cannot create subfolders you will directly have to upload your files whereas in gen2 storage account you can create your folders you can create your containers but within those folders you can create subfolders as well and within those subfolders again you can create subfolders within those subfolders again you can create subfolders and so on and within them you can upload your files if you like so uh, can i say riddhi that in your laptop uh, within your folders can you create subfolders in your laptop riddhi oh uh, yes we can right that is an example of hierarchical storage hierarchical storage that you have a parent folder inside your parent folder you have a child folder inside the child folder you have a sub child folder and so on this is an is example like of inheritance or it's completely different and inheritance no no the it's not inheritance it's different this this is hierarchical hierarchical storage hierarchy that you have a parent folder within parent folder you have a child folder and so on that's hierarchy right for example in your house can i say your parents will have a higher uh, authority as compared to you i mean they have a hierarchy uh, first comes your parent then you and so on you have a hierarchy right so just like that in uh, gen2 storage account you can have folders within folders you can have child folders or sub folders within those sub folders you can have more sub folders and so on and within them you can upload your files similar to how you do in a laptop so riddhi if you want the same scenario same storage scenario that is there in your laptop you will go to which storage account gen1 or gen2 uh, gen2 prefer correct gen2 just like how you store in a laptop right you have folders within folders you have sub folders and so on just like uh, just like how in your laptop if, uh, you have hierarchy of storage your laptop also has hierarchy of storage if you want the same thing to be done in your storage account resource you will choose gen2 storage account resource not gen1 gen2 okay fine with this revision of uh, storage account resource we did then riddhi one last thing after this resource we created one more resource what was that synapse resource right and riddhi tell me is this synapse resource will be used to do what what is the purpose according to you might be wrong not a issue according to you what is the purpose riddhi of creating synapse resource anyone in the chat with purpose jaykesh and other students would already know jaykesh and pradeep and bhaskar would already know anyone apart from that why do we use as to synapse resource what is the purpose it's so, basically for a uh, uh, data uh, resource and management correct uh, data management analyzing data correct data management so within data management riddhi you have three things three main things storing data analyzing data and transforming and transform data transforming both so these three things are done by synapse resource so synapse resource is a single platform through which you can do these three things okay now riddhi you tell me in order to do these three things we will need some uh, server right that does these three things for us correct riddhi yes in order right in order to do these three things like store storing analyzing and transforming we'll need some server okay and synapse does allow us to hire some servers in fact it allows us allows us to hire a group of servers that group of servers is known as a pool so pool is nothing but a group of servers there are two type of pools that it allows us to create first is sql pool second is spark pool okay remember in sql pool you can only write code in sql language in spark pool you can write code in python language scala language r language and so on 
ओके सो देर आर टू टाइप ऑफ पूल पूल इज वॉट रिदी वॉट इज अ पूल okay in spark pool you can even also run sql for i will show you how okay so uh, all right so uh, which pool supports ha has support for multiple languages riddhi spark which pool, pool has support for multiple spark correct okay now in sql pool there are two types one is built in sql pool second is dedicated sql pool Okay, Riddhi, are you familiar with SQL? SQL as a language? Uh, not much. Not much. Okay. Uh, remember that it's a language that is used to work yeah, with. Yeah, structure, query language. It's that ah. I'm aware. Databases, yes. So now uh, you might be aware that there are some commands of SQL. You have create table command that will create the table for you. You have insert a command that will insert the rows into the table and so on. Okay. Uh, so now uh, those commands uh, we have different different type of command. Now you know that. Now as I mentioned, SQL pool is of two types: built-in and dedicated. So what is the difference between built-in SQL pool and dedicated SQL pool, Riddhi? According to you, you might be wrong. Not a worry. According to me, it would be some predefined functions. Ha. So what happens, uh, Riddhi? Is let's say, ha. Right. So what happens, Riddhi? Is let's say I'm running a uh, SQL code. Some okay. I'm running some code in SQL language. Now, uh, in order to run that code, I will need a server or a group of servers. So what Azure will do is, in case of built-in SQL pool, at the time of code running, when the code is running, when you run the code, right? Uh, when when you want to execute the code. Uh, at that time, it will look for a group of servers, and it will find those group of servers and give it to you, so that your code can run on it. Okay, so built-in SQL pool is a temporary pool that is given only at the time of code execution. But let's say you are not executing the code at that time; it's not uh, given to you. Okay, so can I say, Riddhi, built-in SQL pool is is like hiring a Uber? Yes, it can. Yes, so it's the only when you want to travel only then you will hire Uber, and you only pay when you are traveling. Okay. Whereas dedicated SQL and with Uber, what happens once you are done with traveling, then that car is no longer with you. Just like that in built-in SQL pool, once the code execution has happened, then those group of servers are no longer with you. They will be returned back. Okay. Whereas in dedicated SQL pool, it's like buying a private car. So with private car, Riddhi, can I say even if you do not travel, still you have bought a private car, you will have to pay some money, na? My EMI will still be there. Even if I don't I travel guess. with my car, I will still have to pay some money, right? My EMI will still go on. So uh, that's the uh, disadvantage of dedicated pool. But the advantage is what? That it will be available to you for full time, so you can do whatever you want with it. Fine, and so built-in SQL pool is a temporary pool. Dedicated SQL pool is a pool which is available to you for full time. Since built-in SQL pool is a temporary pool, you cannot run commands. You cannot run commands that do changes in the data. So that create table command, update table command, you cannot run that. That changes the data. Okay, you can perform uh, analyzing all the data. So all those uh, commands like select table command and all of that, that will just uh, look at the data 
uh, in the uh, that that will just uh, look at the data and return that data to you. That's all. But it, it doesn't do any changes. A select table command in SQL does not do any changes in the data, and so on. So in built-in SQL pool, you can only run those commands of SQL that do not do any changes in the data. Whereas in dedicated SQL pool, you can run any type of command. Uh, all the type of commands you can run. All the SQL commands you can run. So remember that. Fine. In uh, Spark pool, you have only one option, which is to create a dedicated Spark pool. In Spark pool, there is no option to create a built-in Spark pool. There is only one option, create a dedicated Spark pool. Okay. With this, the uh, little uh, revision uh, is a little, little more clear to you. I understand since your first day, it might not be fully clear, but it helped you. Now it's a little clear. All day it did. Thank you so much for clearing it up. Yes. yes, okay. Fine. Well, all right. So let's go ahead. And what we were doing, guys, was that uh, we wanted to uh, create a pipeline over here. Okay. And uh, what I want to do is I want to extract my data from some place. Okay. Extract my data from some place. Let's say it is GitHub. I can extract data from multiple places. One of them is GitHub. Okay, uh, then in between, I might want to transform it, but this is optional. After that, I want to load that data to some other place. Let's say I want to load it to my storage account. So from GitHub, I want to load it to my storage account. In between, if I want to transform, I can go ahead and transform. Okay, let's see how to do it. So I'll click on the plus button to create a pipeline. Okay, and uh, now what I will do is uh, let's go ahead and let's create a pipeline. So within Synapse, uh, uh, now what I want to do is I want to create a pipeline that does moving of the data and transforming of the data. So I'll go to move and transform section. Here there should be some activities that I can use. This activity called copy data activity will only extract the data and load it into some place. Whereas the second activity can be used to do extraction loading it can also be used to do extraction, transform, and loading. So in between, if you want to do transformation, you can even do that with the second activity. The first activity will only do extract, extraction and loading. It will extract the data from some place, load it into some other place. Okay, whereas the second activity can be used to do extraction, loading. It can also be used to do extraction, transformation, and loading. Okay, fine. So it's up to you, whichever you want to use, uh, depending on the work, depending on your task. Okay, uh, so let me use the copy data activity. It is only used to get the data from one place, put it, push it into some other place. Let me give it a name. I will say this is webinar test pipeline. Oh, sorry, I'm giving a name to this activity. This is uh, copy from GitHub to storage account. Okay, fine. Now, what is my source of the data? So let me select the source. Uh, over here, uh, since I have not uploaded any data set for source, let me create a new one. Okay. So I will be saying that I, I have a link of GitHub. Okay. So I will search for HTTPS, uh, this HTTP. And with this, what will happen is it will ask me that, okay, uh, the data you are getting from my HTTP link. Fine. Agreed. We are getting from HTTP link. But what is that data in which format? Is it a JSON file, Excel file? What is that type of file? Uh, so I will say CSV file. Okay, let me click on continue. Fine. Let me give it a name. I will say that this is data from GitHub. Now I will have to link uh, to that data. So let me create a link and I will say link to GitHub. Link to GitHub. And uh, let me go ahead and let me paste in the link over here. So here you can see there's a URL option. Let me paste in the link. Fine. Rest all the options I'll keep it the same. No need to change it over here. Uh, and uh, fine. Uh, let's go ahead. Let's understand the options. Uh, first is name, of course. Second is description. Next is integration runtime. So what is this integration runtime? Let's go ahead and let's understand. So guys, integration runtime is like a bridge. Okay, integration runtime is like a bridge 
that helps different data systems and services communicate with each other smoothly. So it's crucial for data integration tasks like moving data between databases, moving data between cloud services, and moving data, be data between applications. So how it works, imagine that you have stored data in different places, maybe in a database or on your computer and uh, or any cloud service like Azure SQL database. You stored your data in some place. Now, integration runtime will act as a translator and connector between these da different data sources. So it makes sure that your data moves securely and correctly between them. So whether you are running tasks regularly or you are just transform, uh, transferring data just once, it will make sure that the data moves securely and correctly. Okay. Uh, so that is what integration runtime does. We'll set it to auto resolve integration runtime. I'll say aut automatically uh, Azure will itself uh, do that transferring task. Okay. Fine. I want to connect to which uh, GitHub data. This is the link of that GitHub data. Okay, I have provided the link. Fine, then it says a server certificate validation. Uh, yes, enable. Uh, that means whether that site from which I am getting data, does it have a, a secure certification or not? Okay, uh, fine. So if you want to enable it, you can. If you want to disable, that's up to you. Okay, let me enable it. Anyway, it does not matter. This GitHub site anyways has that certificate. It will check for it when connecting to it. Okay, uh, then. Authentication type. So, what is the authentication type that you want? If you just want to authenticate using basic username and password, you can do it. Uh, if you don't want to authenticate, it's up to you. However, I know that this GitHub data does not have any authentication. So, I don't need to give username and password to connect it. So, I will set it to anonymous. That means any person can access it. And we know, I know that this GitHub data is. Uh, upload in such a manner that there is no username and password set to it. Anybody, anybody can access it. So that's why I have set the auth authentication type to anonymous over here. Okay, we have set the authentication to anonymous. Fine. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, let's understand more over here. Okay. Uh, uh, after that, uh, let me test this connection. Let's see whether this link to GitHub was successful. Yes, it was successful. Fine. So based on the link. Uh, it will go ahead and uh, get the data. Fine. All right. Let me preview the data that I am getting. Let's see whether I am able to read it. Yes. So from that GitHub, I am able to read that data. Okay. Now from that GitHub, I want to load it into some other place. Okay. So GitHub was my source. My sync is what? I want to load it into which place? So wherever you want to load it. Okay. Wherever you want to load it that you will mention in this sync information. This is where you mention information about loading. So where do you want to load? So let's say I want to load uh, into my storage account, right? Okay, so let me create the data set for that. So where do I want to load in my blob storage account? Okay, fine. So uh, and that too, Gen2 blob storage account. I've created Gen2 blob storage account. Let me select that. Okay, I'll click on continue. Then I will say that, okay, the data that you want to load should be in which format? Uh, we know sources in CSV format, but do you want the destination to also be of CSV format? I will say yes. If you want to change it, you can change it up to you. Fine. So I will select continue. Fine. And then we'll link to our uh, source. Okay. This is the link to our, sorry, this is the link to our destination. Our destination is uh, my storage account. Okay. Is my storage account. Okay. And let me uh, create a link for that. I'll have to create a link. Mm. In fact, I should go back, discard changes, and I will say that this is my storage account, that to Gen2 storage account, but I need to link with it. So let me give a name to this link. I will say link to storage account. And fine, we know what integration runtime does. It's basically uh, the one who, uh, that will try, uh, that will get the data properly and securely. Okay, uh, so getting the data or pushing the data properly and securely, that is done by integration runtime. Fine, we'll set it to the default option called auto resolve integration runtime. If you have some other uh, uh, tool that uh, does
Okay, sorry guys. I think I were disconnected in the middle. I hope I am back and uh, there is no voice issue or such. I think I got disconnected in between. Okay, anyways, uh, we were saying connect to our storage account. So, okay, we'll connect to our storage account. And how will we connect? Uh, so it's up to you whether you want to connect using account key or something like that. Or if you want to connect it using managed identity, system assigned, managed identity, user assigned, managed identity. We saw those concepts up to you. How do you want to connect? Okay, so we want to connect uh, from the Azure subscription or do you want to manually uh, provide the URL of your uh, storage account? So I want to connect it manually. So let me select manually from this drop down. Uh, select the subscription in which I have created my storage account resource. And this was the name of my storage account resource, webinar storage res. This was the name. Okay, fine. And let me go ahead and let me test my connection. Find connection is successful and let me uh, create this link properly. Fine, so to create a link to our destination, we have created a link from source. We have also created a link to destination. Now in destination, where do you want to store the file? So I will say I want to store it in data fo folder. Okay, inside data folder, there is a subfolder called CSV. Inside that, I want to store my file. Okay, so inside data folder, there is a subfolder called CSV. And inside that, I want to store my file. If you want to give it a file name, you can. However, if you do not give, Azure will give its own file name. Okay, it will give the same file name as the uh, file name of the source if you do not give a file name over here. Fine, so it's up to you. Fine. Uh, then you have a field called first row as header, which says that, okay, is the first row, uh, should the first row be treated as column names? Should it, be treated, should it be treated as header? Yes, the first row should be treated as header, column names. Fine, so uh, tick mark it. Okay, fine. Anyways, let's go ahead, let's click on okay. And uh, now, all the details I have correctly mentioned over here. Let me first save it. OK, I'll go ahead and save. Now, if you do not save, then what happens? Let me show that to you. OK, let me show that. Now, uh, let's say I want to run this pipeline. In this pipeline, I just want to do this one activity called copy data activity. If you want to do more activities, you can. Like, you can go ahead and get that activity, drag it over here, connect it, connect one activity to another, and so on. You can do it. OK, it's up to you. But let's say I want to run this activity. There are two options to run. First is debug. Second is trigger. With debug, what can happen is you can run the code without changes. Without saving the changes. OK, whereas with trigger, you have to save the changes. So if you want to run without saving changes, click on debug. If you want to run uh, uh, after saving the changes, you can click on trigger. And with trigger, you have three, op uh, you have multiple options. You can uh, uh, schedule the trigger. So if you want the trigger, uh, you want to run the trigger, you want to run the pipeline now, you can run it now. If you want to run it five hours later, you can run it. Or let's say you want to run it every day at so and so time, you can schedule it accordingly as well. Whereas with debug, there is no such scheduling option. Okay, uh, you have to run the pipeline at that point itself. So let me show that to you. I'll click on the uh, debug button. And with that, what will happen is see, it will allow me to run the pipeline even though i have not saved the changes you can see i have not published the changes it's still not published still without that i am able to run okay without that i am able to run but there is a disadvantage also and i'll show that disadvantage so one disadvantage is obviously we are not able to schedule the run that uh, i want to run the pipeline at this particular time it will, with debug button it will run the pipeline at that particular time you can see our pipeline was uh, has succeeded, okay. And if I go back to my uh, storage account, let me go to my storage account resource. Let's see if that copy has worked or not. Let's see if that copy has worked or not. And you can see we have copied our data, okay. This was the CSV file. Let me open it up. I'll click on edit button. And you can see the same data that was there in our source. It's just that we didn't give a name uh, to our source, if you remember. That's why it gave it a default name. If while assigning the destination, okay, if while assigning the destination over here, we would have given a name, for example, 
let me show that to you. Uh, here, you can see file name was kept empty. If you would have uh, signed a file, then it would have uh, worked accordingly. But fine, not a issue. Okay. Uh, so with debug, what happens? Let me ask Pradeep. So Pradeep, please help me out, buddy. Pradeep, are you there? Pradeep? Okay, Pradeep, maybe he is not in front of his laptop. Uh, Jaykesh? Jaykesh, is, is he there? Uh, sorry. Yes, uh, sir. Yes, yes, yes. Achha, sorry. Okay. Even Jaykesh is there and Pradeep is there. Okay, let me ask uh, Pradeep first. So uh, yes, Pradeep was on mute. Uh, let me ask Pradeep first. Uh, so Pradeep, buddy, uh, if I want to run the pipeline, there are two options, debug and trigger. What is the difference between them? OK, the debug will uh, check if any uh, issues and uh, trigger we can add uh, whenever before action or after action. Huh. So see with debug button, what happens is, uh, I mean, I've already uh, uh, debugged it, so that's fine. Uh, but uh, with debug, uh, what happens is if I click on it, I'm able to run the pipeline without saving my changes. You can see my savings are, my changes are not published. They are not saved. Even without that, I'll be able to click on this button. And with that, what will happen? The pipeline will run. Whereas with trigger, have a look. With trigger, if I say, okay, run the pipeline now, can I? Can you see it says that for this, you will have to publish the changes first? Yes, yes, Pradeep? yes, yes, yes. Yes, okay. And see, if I click on publish, that means save the changes, then I'll be able to uh, run the pipeline with trigger option as well. Let me save the changes. Let's see if changes have been saved. It's still saving. So we'll just wait. Once the changes are saved, then you will see that trigger button will work. So that is one change, Pradeep, that you mentioned. That trigger button, uh, with trigger button, we can uh, run the pipeline without saving changes. Sorry, with debug button, we can run it without saving. Whereas with trigger button, we have to save the changes, then only we can run. Okay, any other difference, Pradeep? I think there is another option is there, right? Add or... Huh. So with the, debug... That trigger. Huh. With debug button, what will happen is you will only be able to run the pipeline now. Whereas with trigger button, you can schedule the pipeline that when do you want to run it? So you can click on new button over here under trigger and you can choose when do you want to run it? You, you can schedule it that okay, you want to schedule it at this particular time. You can go ahead and schedule it. Okay, that how, how uh, then uh, uh, do you want uh, to run the pipeline every 15 minutes? Or do you want to run it every 30, 20 minutes? Or what is it? Or do you want to run it uh, once every week? Okay, or whatever it is, you can go ahead and mention it. So that is another change, uh, another difference, I should say, that you gave to me. Okay, any other difference between debug and trigger? So two differences you gave. Okay, both will help us to run the... Uh, uh, code, uh, sorry, run the pipeline, I should say. Both will help us to run. You can see even with debug button, I was able to run the pipeline. Even with trigger button, I'll be able to run it. Okay, even with trigger button, I'll be able to run it. Let's view the pipeline run. And once it's complete it's run, I will show you. Once it's, once it's complete, it's run. I'll show you what to do. Huh. Okay, you can see run was completed. And even here, I was able to correctly run the pipeline. And uh, now if I refresh this, have a look. Okay, now I have a new file copied uh, just now. This was due to trigger button. Previously, it was due to debug. Okay, the above one was due to trigger. Okay, fine. Uh, both debug and trigger allow you to run the uh, pipeline. Okay, both allow you to run the pipeline. Fine. Now, uh, what is the uh, difference in a debug and trigger apart from that? Uh, let's go ahead and let's see. Okay, so we'll go ahead and 
uh, let me mention it, although for this pipeline, it won't make sense. But let me mention it over here. So let's say, let's suppose you have multiple activities, one activity connected to other activity and so on. Now, Pradeep, can I say sometimes I might want to see that at this particular position, at this particular input of the second activity, how was the data looking, correct? Yes. That is only possible only if you click on debug button. Okay. Correct. There you can check uh, the input and output of every activity. Whereas with pipeline, you cannot see the input and output of every activity. You see input and output of a entire pipeline. So you will only in a pipe. Okay. If you click on add trigger button, then you will only be able to see these two things. Input to a pipeline and output to a pipeline. That's all. Okay. Whereas with debug, you will be able to see input and output of every activity. Okay. So debug is always a better option. Trigger should only be used only if you want to schedule uh, the pipeline run. Otherwise, debug, uh, otherwise, trigger is of no such use. Uh, uh, debug has a lot of benefits. Okay. So just to recap, Pradeep, what does trigger do? It shows you an input and output of what? Uh, input and output of the pipeline. And we can uh, do it only after publishing, and we also ah. can schedule it. And with the de debug, we it's not required to publish it. We can run any time uh -huh. without uh -huh. publishing. Correct. We can run it uh, at that time without publishing. But and the benefit is you can see the input and output of every activity in the pipeline. Okay. So right. is it like, for example, uh, the first task between and second task, we can see uh, this particular task as well. The next one, uh, huh. so where we can see that? Huh. So let's say uh, when you when you run the, uh, this now, although here there is just one activity, there is no group of activities. So this will not be the ideal place to show to you, but let me click on debug. So what will happen is for every activity, you will see the input and output. Okay, let me wait for this to complete. This currently this is just one activity, right? In my pipeline. So although it yes. won't make sense. Uh, but fine. Over here, let me wait for this complete uh, uh, pipeline to complete its execution. So with trigger, you only see the input and output of a pipeline, but with debug, you see input and output of every activity in the pipeline. So let's say Pradeep, if anything goes wrong in the uh, pipeline run, then I might want to find out the issue, na? because in a pipeline, I yes. might have multiple activities here, though I just have a single activity in current scenario, but ideally in real world, you might multiple activities. You want to find out where exactly did it go wrong. Okay. So with this debug helps you that it tells you the input and output of every activity. For example, see input and output of this activity. Whereas with pipeline, you only see input and output of a pipeline as a whole. But with debug, you see input and output of every activity in that pipeline. Here there is this one activity. So you only see input and output of that particular activity. Input is this. Okay. And output is so and so. Fine. Like that, you can know that, okay, where exactly the issue happened? Uh, was the issue because of second activity in the pipeline? Was the issue because of the fifth activity in the pipeline? Where was the issue? Anyways, you're in this pipeline. I just had one activity so that anyways, uh, difference you will not be able to know. But remember this, that debug helps you to see input and output of every activity in the pipeline, whereas trigger only shows you input and output of the entire pipeline not for the individual activities within it. Okay. So debug is always a better choice than trigger. Uh, trigger should only be used when you want to schedule it. Otherwise, debug is always a better choice. Okay. Fine. Uh, so with this, uh, we have completed our first uh, pipeline. Okay. Uh, then what is the develop section used, uh, Jaykesh? What is develop section used for? Integrate was used to create a pipeline when we did create a pipeline. 
what so is here we can here we can do the uh, some uh, on completion or something like that correct code you right we can write code to do our task whether it is analyzing task whether it is transforming task if you want to run code to do that you can do it okay so for example uh, let's suppose let me add a data uh, in fact i'm just thinking over here uh, from where can i obtain my data in this particular scenario i'm just thinking uh, should we have the data mm -hmm. okay let me get the data i already have linked my data if you remember for my pipelines i already created a link for my source and destination so fine i already have created links and here are those links i have created a link uh, to my uh, storage account container inside that we have this folder called csv and inside that i have these files that i copied okay fine let's say i want to analyze this okay a shortcut way to do is what uh, let me go ahead and let me explain that to you first i'll go to properties and what i will do is i'll go ahead and copy the path for it okay let me go ahead and let me copy the path and i can copy the path and that part i can mention it in my code or a shortcut way to work with this is you right click on it click on new sql script and you will say that i want to load the data in the file instead of inside of my sql script let me click on load and it will automatically write the code if you want to write it yourself you can go ahead and do it in the develop section however if you want to automatically uh, write some sample code then there is an option to write that sample code as well let's wait for it to write that sample code okay and uh, one second currently it says fail to detect schema why is that why did it fail to detect we had a csv file correctly mm. We had a CSV file. Uh, over here, I have my CSV file. Achha, no issues. I'll do one thing. Uh, I will just take the copy. I will copy the path of it and I'll write my own code. Fine. No, not a worry. I'll write my own code over here. So I can write my own SQL code. Fine. Write me, write my own SQL code. I'll say select star from. Uh, since I want to copy from this particular file path i will use this function open row set i will say i want to uh, take the data inside of this particular file this is a csv file right and uh, then what is the format i will say csv so let me mention the format over here okay apart from format uh, i might want it to correctly read uh, the data inside of it, so I'll say partial version equal to two version, which is the latest version to read the data. Fine. And with this, I'll just go ahead and complete my SQL code. I won't explain the uh, syntax of the SQL code. Fine. I'll just save the changes and let me run this SQL code over here. Let's see whether it works. If it does not work, there might be some issue. Uh, it says can't be open because it does not exist. How does that not exist? It does exist. Uh, it does exist. Any mistake I have done? It does exist. Uh, it does exist. My data is there. Let me get the properties of this file. My data is there. Any issue while integrating it? Let's see. Let's correct it. OK, I'll go back, replace uh, the link of a new, uh, replace the link of previous file with this new file, save the changes and then run the code. Let's see. Let's say this does not exist as well. OK, this worked. I guess the previous file was still in use or something like that. Fine, we'll have to work with that previous file, but fine. OK, uh, this file is working. Now, currently what is happening is the first row should be treated as header or column name. So I will just say over here that header row equal to true. 
with this what will happen is the first row will be treated as column names okay let me go ahead and let me mention it i'll save the changes and run my code let me run it fine and now i can do analysis on it i can say that for every category uh, give me the count of product for every category give me the count of product i'm not explaining the sql code to you the syntax and everything i'm assuming that you have already done it i'm just specifying that you can do all of this analysis over here so if in case any of you are freshers you have not learned sql this syntax might be very very new to you but what i'm intending to show to you that yes you can do analysis as i mentioned that on synapse you can do analysis and let me run the code to prove to you that you can do various analysis currently i have a error uh, let's try to understand what is that error it seems there is some issue over here mm. where care column name okay category uh, um, utf8 encoded text okay everything seems fine what is the issue uh, sorry, I didn't group by. Oh, my mistake. My uh, code is incomplete. How will it work? My mistake. Sorry, mistake that I did. Fine. So for every category, I wanted to see the product count. Let's go ahead and let's run the code. Let's run the code now. And let's see whether it works. I'm saving the changes. And now let me run it. Okay. And you can see it. I have run. So I have said that, okay, in the data, for every category of products, give me the count of products. So it said that, for this category, there are three products in your data. For another category, there is one product in your data and so on. So you can see I've done this analysis. Like that, I can do more and more analysis. In order to do this analysis, I use built-in SQL pool. If you want to use dedicated SQL pool, you can do that as well. The difference is in built-in SQL pool, you won't be able to run that create table command. If you try to run it in your built-in SQL pool, you will get an error. Whereas the same thing, if you do it in a dedicated SQL pool, you won't get an error. Try and do it in your free time and it will be exactly like we mentioned over here. Okay, fine. So remember that in built-in SQL pool, only this basic analysis code like select table command and all of that will work. But if you are doing any command that does changes in the data, that will not work. Like create table command, insert into table command and all of that, that will not work. Fine. So you can do analysis, you can do a transformation with code up to you. Okay, fine. So this was just an overview of Synapse service. This was the goal today, to have an overview of Synapse service. Uh, and here you can see, you can view the data in the, you can view the output in the form of a table or in the form of a chart. Uh, whichever chart you want, you can go ahead and visualize it over here. Line chart, bar chart, whatever you want, you can go ahead and see. Okay. Fine. Uh, so for example, I want the product count, right? So I guess category column should be this. Uh -huh, legend is product count. Huh. So for example, in uh, this category called locks, there is only one product count. In this category called mountain bikes, there is 32 products in my data. In this category called road bikes, there are 43 products in my data. So you can see I can do that analysis in a much, much simpler manner. Okay. If you want to export it as an image, you can go ahead and do it. If you want to export it in the form of any type of file, JSON file or any other file, you can do that as well. It's completely up to you. All right. So remember this, guys. Uh, this was just the overview of Synapse service. Based on this, usually you will get at least five questions asked in your DP900 examination. At least five. Okay. Total, you will have anywhere around 38 to 43 questions. But based on this, you will have at least five questions asked. So based on what we did today, at least five questions you will get in your examination. Okay, fine. Uh, so that is it for today, guys. Uh, hope what we did today made sense. Uh, huh, Abbas has a question. Abbas says, uh, Ha, all right. So you were uh, telling me about that code, right? In which I had done that uh, mistake. I had not used that group by clause. Yes. So Abbas mentioned about that. And as Abbas mentioned that in my built-in SQL pool, these commands that do changes in the data, like DDL SQL commands, 
DML SQL commands won't work. Whereas with dedicated SQL pool, it went, it will work. So in the same editor, if I select dedicated SQL pool, it will work. Okay, Abbas. So coding file is the same. It's just that the pool you have to change. That's all. Okay, Deepak says previously screen was not visible, but I guess now it's visible. Bave says, can this link be used as a map drive? Okay, what is the intention as a map drive? I mean, you can use the link for anything provided that you have provided necessary authentication. You can use the link for any purpose. Okay, you can use the link of the data for any purpose, provided that you have the necessary authentication. Okay, if you remember our synapse was automatically connected to our uh, storage account resource, so no authentication was needed for that. Okay, so if I want to use any data in my storage account the resource and I want to analyze it over here, I can do it without authentication because by default it's connected, right? At the time of synapse creation, it wanted to connect to storage account resource. So at that time they were connected together. Okay, but let's say if you want to use uh, the storage account data somewhere else, Apart from Synapse, yes, you will have to provide the link along with necessary authentication. But huh, you can use it for any purpose, Bhavesh. Up to you. So guys, what we did today made sense. Synapse uh, made sense, guys. Uh, Pradeep, today we had an overview of Synapse service. So Synapse service is what we did today. Okay, we had an overview of it. Like that, there are many services. Uh, that you can be asked in DP900 examination. Okay, one of the major ones was Synapse. So we tried to have an overview of Synapse service. Okay, based on this Pradeep, you can get anywhere between four to five questions uh, in your uh, DP900 examination. At least five is uh, what I have observed. Okay, so based on what we learned today, you might get asked at least five questions. So whatever fields we uh, saw, while filling those forms, what is the meaning behind those fields and all of that? So today we covered one service called Synapse service. That is what we did for week today. Any other doubt, guys? Uh, guys, it made sense, everyone. Whatever we did made sense. I hope it did. Yes, Omesh, okay. Fine. So that's it for today, guys. Uh, thank you so much for attending. I hope the webinar was valuable to you. Today we had an overview of Synapse service. We'll have more webinars scheduled wherein we'll try to cover more and more services going forward. Uh, so that's it for today, guys. Thank you for attending. Have a great day and bye everyone. Bye guys.
हेलो गाइस आई शेयर द फीडबैक फॉर्म बिफोर लिविंग द सेशन प्लीज मेक श्योर यू फिल द फीडबैक फॉर्म